In May 1990, a convicted killer was released from a prison in Austria, having only served 15 years and four months behind bars. His name, Jack Unterweger. A brutal killer who is now going to embark on what I think is one of the most horrifying killing sprees in modern European history. A masterful manipulator, Unterweger was living the double life of a celebrated writer and that of a serial killer. Once released from prison, he went on to kill nine women and was suspected of a further two in just over a year. He possessed what one calls the charm of a psychopath. The style was completely different. It was absolute brutality and bursts of violence. His victims all died in the same way, each strangled using the same knot. You are face to face with them. You are seeing the life drain out of them. You can choose to stop. You can choose to carry on. In public, he was the poster boy of prison reform in Austria, who transformed from murderer to model citizen. But little did his supporters know that Jack Unterweger was leading a double life and was, in fact, one of the world's most evil killers. In June 1976, 25-year-old Jack Unterweger was found guilty by a court in Salzburg, Austria, of the brutal murder of a young German woman. Unterweger confessed. He was sentenced to life. However, Unterweger served just over 15 years. He was released in May 1990, and only a few months later, prostitutes started to disappear. For the next 10 months, Unterweger went on a killing spree across Austria, the former Czechoslovakia, and even the United States. Unterweger was suspected of murdering 11 women, but was convicted of just nine. I'm absolutely astounded at the fact that Unterweger was released from prison many, many years before he should have been. People like Unterweger can change. They can change in prison if they acknowledge that what they've done is wrong and if they undertake work to address those traits and those behaviours that lead them to the decision to harm others. But he didn't go through that process at all. He was, without question, perverted, depraved killing machine. And I can think of very few, probably less than 20, who would deserve comparison with him. It is an extraordinary story, and one which sends a shiver down my spine every time I tell it. In 1975, during the trial of his first murder, Unterweger was assessed by a psychiatrist. He was diagnosed as an extremely dangerous, unpredictable and incurable individual. The report stated he demonstrated egocentricity, aggressiveness and sexual perversion with a sadistic component. Psychopaths are people who feel and behave and relate to others in ways that are different from the rest of us. The way that I often describe psychopathy is it's a form of emotional emptiness. So there aren't that complex range of emotions that the rest of us have, like love and guilt and regret. It is quite black and white for psychopaths. I want this particular thing and I'm going to not stop until I've got it. Dr. Reinhard Haller is a leading psychiatrist in Austria who worked on the case. Studying the first murder, it was clear to him that Unterweger was an exceptionally callous killer. This was a highly sadistic murder in which he abducted this girl who was walking home on an extremely cold winter's night. He drove her naked through the forest with a steel rod in his hand taking great delight in her impending death from exposure, but ultimately strangled her with her bra. It was an incredibly vicious and incredibly sadistic moment. The extraordinary story of this sadistic killer begins nearly 70 years ago. 
Johann Jack Unterweger was born on the 16th of August 1950 in Judenburg in Styria, southern Austria. He was the illegitimate son of a waitress and an American soldier who left before Jack was born. His mother spent short spells in jail, and when Jack was two years old, he was placed into the care of his grandfather. According to Unterweger, his childhood was far from ideal. Jack Unterweger clearly had issues. He grew up without a father. His mother over the years developed a serious alcohol problem. Due to this, little Jack grew up in a hut in Carinthia with his grandfather. I was exposed to many things a child should not see. He's also learning things about women from his grandfather, who was a notorious philanderer. He's learning that women are there to be used and abused and discarded. So that's something that's ingrained in him from quite an early age. He also saw his grandfather bringing his lovers, or rather prostitutes, to this hut again and again, and the four-year-old boy witnessed their sexual activities and much more. And so there was this negative impact on his early years. In 1958, Unterweger left his grandfather's home and stayed with some relatives. Shortly after, he was placed in the foster care system. He didn't form those attachments with his caregivers, those consistent attachments that provide that secure environment in which children can grow up and feel safe and develop. A child in this kind of situation, they become very, very focused on their own survival. He almost inevitably fell into this criminal role and showed this type of behavior from a very early age. He failed in his compulsory education and he displayed delinquent behavior in his youth. In December 1974, now aged 24, Unterweger's desires took a deadly turn. He was traveling with his girlfriend through Germany when they drove past a friend of hers, 18-year-old Margaret Schäfer. They stopped and robbed her, driving to her parents' house to rob them too. But the crimes didn't stop there. Unterweger took the 18-year-old girl to a nearby wood and ordered her to undress. He tied her up, beat her with a steel rod, and then strangled her with her own bra. So he sees an opportunity here. He sees this woman walking who his girlfriend knows. There's an opportunity there for, for him to have control over somebody, to manipulate them and to do what he wants with them. The police questioned Unterweger's girlfriend, and she confessed that he had killed her friend. Once in police custody, Unterweger also confessed to the killing, claiming he had a fit of rage. On the 1st of June, 1976, before his 26th birthday, Unterweger began a life sentence for the murder. But this was far from the end of his story. From being what could only be described as a low-life, uneducated brute capable of killing an 18-year-old, he suddenly becomes a changed man. He teaches himself to read and write properly, and he begins a very adventurous career as a writer. In fact, writes not one but two bestsellers. He is very much the model prisoner. Now that he could read and write, Unterweger spent time in the prison library. He was uneducated, but with a large appetite for knowledge. One day in the library, he came across a book by an author completely unknown to him, and he says to himself, quite narcissistically, what he can do, I can do too. And then he began to write stories and Paradoxically, he wrote, among other things, these episodes for a radio program which was very popular among children and families back then. It was called the bedtime program for little ones, The Little Sandman is Coming. This was such a very idyllic, lovely, comforting, soporific program 
which I also listened to as a child. Unterweger became famous as the man who wrote children's stories, poetry and prose about life in prison. His autobiography, Fieger Feuer, meaning purgatory, became a bestseller and was made into a film. The Austrian literati were delighted to have discovered someone like Jack Unterweger. Unterweger suddenly attracted the attention of the media. People showed support for his release. These were people, some of whom were very well known, like journalists and artists, who showed their support for good reasons. Let's say they had good intention. The intellectuals said, wonderful, finally we have a criminal who reformed himself, who, as it were, confessed to his actions through his writing and processed them therapeutically. Such a person can only be a good person. And they fell for him. They really fell for him. Austria at the time was in the midst of reforming its prison services. Jack Unterweger's newly found literary prowess in prison was just what the reformers needed to prove the new system could be successful. The calls for Unterweger's early release grew louder and louder. Intellectuals, artists, writers, journalists, and even politicians campaigned for Unterweger to be free. Now there was unbelievable pressure for his release at all costs. And that's what finally happened. However, there were voices who warned that hiding behind this charming and manipulative man is a very dangerous, malicious narcissist. On the 23rd of May 1990, 39-year-old Jack Unterweger was released from Stein Prison in Lower Austria. He had only served a little over 15 years of his life sentence for strangling an 18-year-old to death. He was actually released without any safeguards. That means he did not even have to go to see his probation officer or to a psychiatrist where he would have been treated further. He was completely free. A brutal killer who is now going to embark on what I think is one of the most horrifying killing sprees in modern European history. Unterweger was given a second chance as a free man, thanks to the campaigning of Austria's artistic community to release him. Unterweger moved to Vienna, where he mingled with the rich and famous. He played the role of the model rehabilitated prisoner. Unterweger had them all fooled. Obviously, the people who ran the prison wanted to advocate in their favor because it's a great advertisement. They see, the system works. We can put somebody who is as bad and as evil as a psychopath who kills somebody in cold blood. And this psychopath has rehabilitated in 15 years. He is now a writer, a person who is known by the people in Austria. So he was the success story of the criminal justice system. And I think we got too carried away with that and lost sight of the fact that this was an individual who had harmed someone else, who had taken someone else's life, and that wasn't something that had been addressed, so of course he was going to do it again. Unterweger was released from prison without the need to regularly speak to a psychiatrist. There was no real supervision, and he was able to live the life of a free man. He was very charming, quite intelligent, but also a highly manipulative person who was not mentally ill, but had an abnormal personality. He moves to Vienna, becomes the darling of cafe society, buys a white Ford Mustang. This is a man with some considerable uh, vanity and turns himself into a uh, famous guest part-time journalist, uh, writer, television studios, radio talks, reads his poetry to adoring crowds, many of them women, and generally struts his stuff. Unterweger became a celebrity and often appeared on television news programs. In 1990, he joined a panel with journalist Paul Yvonne to discuss prison reform. 
Er wurde als ein quasi Experte. He was invited as basically an expert to report on his experiences in the penitentiary. He happened to sit next to me in this club. He appeared in a white suit. As far as I can remember, he had a bright red carnation, I think, in the buttonhole. The normal reaction of a journalist is curiosity and interest. What kind of guy? What kind of person is he? It's very easy for Unterweger to lead a double life because he can very effectively compartmentalize parts of his life and his existence. He's a very accomplished actor at this point. He's playing this role of the reformed criminal, of the man who's changed, and he's absolutely loving the spotlight that comes along with it. So he wants that, that narcissistic element of him wants that continued attention and this adoration. Unterweger also continued to write and gave readings of his works, where he built up a large female fan base. He also showed up in various bars, where he always picked up women. What's really impressive is the incredible number of women he had made contact with. I believe he did not spend one night alone and very few nights with the same woman. Despite his re-entering into society appearing a success to the outside world, Unterweger's dark instincts remained. A lot of people will come out of prison, they don't even have a job and they'll have to struggle probably for the rest of their lives. But he came out, he had money, he had a job, he already had a career pretty much set up, so he had all the opportunity. But the problem with killers is that they can't curb the urge. He is a man who's positively bursting with self-importance and vanity, but he is also the same man who was cruel, manipulative and violent towards women from the age of 16 onwards. Nothing has changed, only this time he chooses his targets carefully. In September 1990, just four months after his release from prison, Unterwege killed again. And once more, he traveled abroad to find his victim, this time to the country formerly known as Czechoslovakia. She was the 29-year-old shop assistant in Prague, Blanka Botskova. Her body was found on the banks of the Vitava River, lying on her back with her legs wide open and covered with twigs and leaves. She'd been strangled with a pair of stockings. The last time she was seen alive was at a bar, talking to a well-dressed man around 40 years old. This was just the beginning of Unterweger's undetected killing spree. I can only imagine that it must have emboldened him incredibly. I mean, he must have felt literally godlike. I can do whatever I want. I can dress them and undress them. This is a man who has contempt for women. That's the only possible word for it, utter contempt. And what's more, he intends to indulge himself as long as he can get away with it. And my goodness me, does he get away with it? A month after the murder in Prague in October 1990, Unterweger began a new killing spree, murdering three women. The body of Brunhilde Massa was found naked in a forest near Graz in Austria, nearly three months after she disappeared. In December 1990, Heide Hammerer was killed in a forest near Lustenau, close to the German border. Both women had been beaten and strangled with their tights. March 1991, Elfrieda Schrempf disappeared near Graz. Her body was only found seven months later. We're looking at somebody who strangled his victims, but then disposed of the bodies in the open air in forests, and it was often a long time, weeks or months, before they were discovered. Obviously, the decomposition process, the fact that animals have access to those bodies, will damage them. It will limit what the pathologist can say. But quite often, the body is much better preserved than necessarily you would think at first glance. And quite often, at least some information can be gleaned. If there was, say, bruising in the tissues of the neck from a strangulation, it would still be relatively identifiable. In some cases, we could never say what happened. In others, the evidence can still remain quite strong for prolonged periods. 
When we look at the murders he commits after he's left prison, they are much more meticulously planned. The first murder was very much an opportunity which he took advantage of, and the, the circumstances around that left an awful lot of evidence behind. There was a witness, so of course he was going to be convicted for that. So when he comes out, he's sure he's not going to make those same mistakes again, and he's very careful, he plans, he's incredibly organised. Little is known about where exactly the victims died and what happened to them before they died. Unterweger picked them up in his car and presumably drove them to an isolated area in a forest. Police had no leads to follow until Unterweger attacked again, but this time his murderous plan failed. We do know a few things because one of his victims survived. And from this evidence, it is quite clear that sexual acts were involved too. But in my opinion, these were not of prime importance. Of prime importance was the sadism, that he wanted to torture the women, that he wanted to exercise power under all circumstances. All of Unterweger's victims shared a similar fate at the moment of their death. If you look at the method that he used for killing his victims, he, he strangled them. And that is the ultimate control method in terms of a way of killing somebody. You are face to face with them. You are seeing the life drain out of them. You can choose to stop. You can choose to carry on. Unterweger's victims were found naked or half naked, lying face down with their legs spread apart and partly covered with twigs and leaves. By now, this was an all-too-familiar M.O. We always see this practice with serial killers. They perform almost ritualized killings. And at the end, they also have a funeral. In his case, it consisted of covering half of the corpse, as was discovered with some of the skeletons. But no one suspected Unterweger of the killings. He was free to continue. He's learned that women are there to be used and abused. That's something that he's learned from an early age. He knows that that's wrong, but he chooses to do it anyway because he enjoys doing it. He likes to dominate others. He likes to have that feeling of power over other people. And because he has no compassion, he has no empathy for the suffering of others, he's an incredibly dangerous man. March 1991, Unterweger was living the high life in Vienna's coffee culture society. He was a charming, wealthy and influential poet, but he was also leading a double life. Since leaving prison, he had killed at least four women, and no one suspected a thing. Up until this point, he'd travelled to commit the murders. But now he turned his attention closer to home, killing three prostitutes in Vienna. It's an act of the most incredible arrogance. Add vanity to arrogance, and you have a vision of Unterweger's view of himself. And we, we are talking about a man now who is on a spree, full-out spree. He chooses wisely. He's clearly trawling red light districts. It's hard to miss Unterweger because he's driving a white Ford Mustang, but no one puts two and two together. He's always had a sense of entitlement. He's always felt like he deserves better than other people. But at the same time, he's also got those lessons that he's learned from his early years, that women are there to be used and abused and discarded. So women are the vehicle through which he achieves the, the control that he craves. A reporter claiming to be working for the Austrian public broadcaster ORF was investigating the strange disappearance of sex workers in Vienna for a radio programme. His name, Jack Unterweger. In Austria, there are 0.5 to 0.7 killings of prostitutes per year. And now, suddenly, there were seven or eight cases within a year. This was conspicuous. And then the top crime detective got a visit from a reporter named Jack Unterweger, who was equipped with a microphone, and asked him, there are so many prostitutes being killed in Austria, the population is worried. That's a scandal. Why have the police not been more successful? 
and during one of these live interviews, this official told him, yes, we're checking up on all sexual murderers, including you. And he's loving every minute of this because he knows that he's the one behind the murders that he's talking about. And psychopaths enjoy playing with people. They enjoy kind of pressing their buttons and having a bit of fun and knowing that they're the ones who've got this knowledge that other people don't. So he's essentially, he's having a good time. This is amusing for him. He's getting a lot of gratification out of it. Untervega's radio programme was a bold cover-up of his crimes. He also now had a reason to visit the red light district, explaining why his white Ford Mustang with the registration W Jack 1 was spotted and why he was seen talking to prostitutes. It is the act of the most extraordinary vanity and arrogance rolled into one. Not only am I killing the prostitutes, now I'm reporting on the fact that I've terrified the prostitutes in Vienna. It is, I mean, it is truly astonishing, absolutely, and I use the word rarely, that is astonishing. He might have done it just to tease the police. Some serial killers, they do. The longer you go without having people after you, people knocking on your door, the more cock you get. He's presenting himself as the champion of these women's rights, as, as their defender, as, as somebody who really does genuinely care about them. So, so this is really, really chilling stuff. Police in Vienna did have Unterweger on their list of possible suspects, but they had no hard evidence. Unterweger often had an alibi for the days on which the crimes happened. He'd either been to a reading, given a radio interview, or been with a girlfriend. Now, not everyone is completely convinced by Unterweger. Certainly one police officer is beginning to see similarities with the crime that he was eventually convicted for the killing of the 18 year old with a steel rod. In fact, that police officer also suspected he may have killed once before. But those odd suspicions do not affect his celebrity in Vienna. Indeed, he's so celebrated and so brazen, he gets commissioned to go to Los Angeles to write a piece about prostitution. In June 1991, Unterweger traveled to the US he stayed in the former Cecil Hotel in downtown L.A. It had a reputation for violence and suicide at the time. Unterweger was not the first serial killer to have stayed there. It was already famous as the hangout of the night stalker, Richard Ramirez. Within a few weeks of landing, he had killed three women in Los Angeles, all of them prostitutes. And I think there was a sense in which he was getting a bit bored. And often you see this with psychopaths. They have that, that proneness to boredom, that need for stimulation. So they will often start to vary their offending behavior to mix things up a bit and to keep it interesting. So I think potentially that was what lay behind the decision to, to continue killing people outside of that country. All three murders were meticulously planned in advance. Unterweger's first LA victim was Shannon Exley, a prostitute allegedly popular with truckers. Nine days later, he killed again Irene Rodriguez, originally from Texas. And five days after that, he killed Sherry Ann Long, who was later found in the hills of Malibu. All three women were strangled with a bra using the same very distinct knot, a signature. Some people use a certain method, for example, with strangulation, that would be the MO, the motus operandi. But if they use the strangulation with a cord, then the cord would be the signature. In his case, I don't think he used the bra of the girls a lot of the time. But he did a specific knot. I don't think he did the knot because um, Untervega wanted people to know it was him. He did the knot because he knew the knot worked. And it's the same thing that it happens with so many serial killers. They use a method or a signature because they know he works. Unterwege left LA and returned home to Vienna before detectives could link him to the murders. But while he was away, the police in Vienna were now working closely with their counterparts in Graz, the site of the murders after he was released from prison. They realized the murders were in fact linked a pattern started emerging, with Unterwege being in the same area of Austria that the murders were committed. The police realized they were now dealing with a serial killer. 
On the 13th of February 1992, one year and nine months after he was released from prison, an arrest warrant was issued by the Graz judiciary. Unterweger had fled with his girlfriend, this time to Miami. But his escape didn't last long. He's finally tracked down to Florida in the United States because the authorities have begun to put various parts of the puzzle together. And he's arrested and extradited in May 1992 to stand trial in Austria. When he talks to the television camera and he says, I've only had two years of freedom and he appears to be quite upset, we shouldn't be fooled by that. The only person that he feels sorry for is himself. And this is a skilled manipulator. This is somebody who's learned by observing the behavior of other people, what kind of emotions he can display that will elicit some kind of sympathy. During the extradition process, Detective Ernst Geiger from the Vienna Police Department discovered further links to prove Unterweger's guilt. He'd searched Unterweger's home and found evidence of his visit to L.A. So he contacted the L.A. Police Department and discovered the three similar murders in their district. The evidence found at Unterweger's home placed him in the areas of each crime scene. The detective expanded his search across Europe, asking if there were any other unresolved murders with the same M.O. Prague police replied with the case of Blanka Bodskova. She was the first woman Unterweger killed after his release from jail. The case was building, and Unterweger was charged with the murders of 11 women. On the 28th of May 1992, Unterweger was extradited from the US to Austria. The minor celebrity and poster boy of prison reform was again in police custody. It's not often that you get a killer who was that well known to a society. And in his case, it's very interesting to me that he killed, then he went to prison, then he came out early with a brand new profession and with an amazing chance of just carrying on with a brand new life, 10 times better than the life he had before. It just goes to show that the hate he had inside him towards women was so intense that nothing would have stopped him. Unterweger's trial began on the 20th of April 1994 at the courthouse in Graz. Many of his friends from Vienna still believed in Unterweger's innocence. But the prosecution had gathered strong evidence against him, including for the first time in an Austrian murder case, DNA. The event attracted an enormous amount of media attention. You had to register, which was something completely new back then, having to register as a journalist in a public proceeding. This big group of his supporters, his fans, even the female ones, they were already nowhere to be seen or heard. Because during the long pre-trial process, many details had come to light which made it so clear he was as guilty as sin. Unterweger was defended by two lawyers during what was a complicated and lengthy trial. One of them was Graz-based Dr. Hans-Jürgen Lee Hofer. Every single victim, every single murder had been examined. The whole thing took three months. With many of the victims, it was no longer possible to establish how the women died, how they were murdered. Because sometimes only the skeleton was left as the bodies had been in the forest. The court was shown photographs of the first woman he killed after his release, Blanka Botskova. She was murdered in September 1990 in Prague. The shocking images left a deep impression on everyone in the courtroom, but not on Unterweger. The judge then asked, are there any questions? And Unterweger tells me, quite excitedly, go on, ask him something, ask already. Obviously, he was not affected by the image of this naked girl, the corpse, and this person who was strangled. 
whose facial expressions are not pretty. He kept telling me to ask, ask, ask. I didn't know what to ask. I wasn't able to ask, and he didn't care. Go on, ask, ask, ask. For two of the murders, the prosecution presented DNA evidence. A hair belonging to victim Blanka Botskova had been found in Unterweger's car, and red fibers found on another victim's body corresponded to a red scarf found in Unterweger's home. When Unterweger was first asked by police about his whereabouts in Prague, unaware of possible DNA evidence, he answered that he had been to the city, but that he hadn't picked up anyone. If he had said, I met a girl there, took her to my car and we did things together, going for a ride, drinking a beer or something, then it would have been possible to explain why a girl's hair was in his car. But because he said, I never took a girl in my car in Prague, now the question was, how did Botskova's hair get into the car of Jack Unterweger? This practically sealed the chain of evidence. Another key piece of evidence was Unterweger's modus operandi. He strangled his victims, always using the same kind of knot. Austrian police got in touch with the FBI in the US and asked if there was a way to analyze this specific knot. An American specialist had the answers they needed. Boa came to Graz for the trial of Jack Unterweger. She was asked for her opinion on the knots. She said, I tell you the same thing I told the Austrian investigators at the time. If you find the person who tied one of these knots, then you've undoubtedly found the one who tied all these knots. This is a very special knot. I can remember how this American woman had the original bra in her hand and showed it to the jury. You could see how tightly the neck was constricted by the knot. And I think that was the turning point in the process. That's when I could really notice it. One had to imagine that the victim's neck was compressed to this diameter. That was a moment when it was dead quiet in the overcrowded courtroom, even though there were hundreds of people in there. And Jack Unterweger, who has always had such a particularly straight, present, slightly dominant posture, and who always looked with a certain, I would say, impudence, as if to say, look, I have nothing to hide. The horror of the jury when they saw this bra could really be felt physically. And that was also the turning point, when the mood turned against Unterweger. That was the moment when, you could see it in his body language, he slipped back into his seat and grew smaller and smaller. His colour drained. And then he just sat there, I was thinking, now, that was the moment. This is it. The hunt is over. But Unterweger stood by his innocence to the very end. The Austrian jury consisted of eight members. If the verdict is at least four against four, the accused goes free. Throughout the trial, Unterweger regularly talked to Dr. Haller in his prison cell. He would discuss how he thought the jury was reacting on each day. He closely monitored the eight jurors during the trial. He always knew who were skeptical, who were against him, who were for him. And he told me every day after the trial, today four were for me and four against me. Today three were skeptical, and so on. People like Hunterweger are incredibly intelligent and they will pick up on other people's emotions, other people's feelings. Even though they don't have that complexity of emotion themselves, they learn through observing other people the kind of behaviours that they need to display, the sorts of things that they need to say to get what they want. 
absolutely certain he was confident in his own mind that he could convince at least four of them that he was innocent. Unterweger is so confident that he decides that he will give the final speech in his defense. Unterweger then delivered, in my opinion, a brilliant concluding speech in his defense. And the jury vote was never eight to zero for guilty. Rather, it was always only five to three or six to two. So there were always a few jurors who were still convinced of Unterweger's innocence. But Unterweger's impassioned speech did not sway the jury on all charges. On the 28th of June 1994, at approximately 9 p.m., the verdict was read out. He was found guilty of nine of the 11 murder charges against him and sentenced to life in prison. He placed an appeal against the verdict. Unterweger then returned to his cell, where six hours later, he hanged himself with the string from his jogging bottoms and his shoelaces. It was confirmed that the knot he used to tie the noose was the same he'd used to strangle his victims. Well, Unterweger was a cold and calculating and ruthless psychopath who enjoyed harming other people. And I think that the real shame with this case is that the Austrian criminal justice system completely missed its opportunity to put the brakes on his offending because they became too dazzled with the individual that he was presenting as, and far too many people were conned by him. Um, he's one of those people who really does send a shiver down my spine because he would appear to be so charming. And I'm not surprised that the prostitutes got into the car with him, or some may even have recognised him. But he knew they were never going to live to tell the tale, so he saw no worry in that. The ultimate killing machine. Jack Unterweger was a sadistic murderer who killed women for his own gratification. His double life and charming character enabled him to continue with his killing spree undetected. Society wanted to believe he was a reformed man, but sadly, that was not the case. Unterweger fooled them all and was, without a doubt, one of the world's most evil killers. On December the 1st, 1996, Tracy Andrews and her fiance Lee Harvey were driving home after a night out when suddenly they began to be pursued by another car. It was a chase that would end in Lee's murder. He was stabbed in the throat, back, front, repeatedly, viciously and continuously. Just two days later, 27-year-old Tracy gave a heart-wrenching press conference appealing for the public's help to find her partner's killer. But all was not what it seemed. You get behind the wheel of the car. You know, sometimes you change personality. And we all kind of looked at each other and thought, this, you know, this enormous story just got 10 times bigger again if she is the killer. There had been no car chase. There had been no random attack. Tracy Andrews had stabbed her own fiance to death and was trying to get away with murder. This is a woman of cunning, of deceit, and with a vicious temper. Tracy Andrews had deceived a nation and become one of the world's most evil killers. It was a press conference that shocked Britain when 27-year-old Tracy Andrews defiantly appeared in front of the world's media on December the 3rd, 1996. She wept over the murder of her fiancé, Lee Harvey. She claimed a stranger had stopped the couple in their car before stabbing her 25-year-old partner to death in a savage attack. I just tried to stop the bleeding, really, and comfort him as much as I could. But it was all a lie. 
In reality, Andrews had killed Lee in the most brutal of manners. At her trial, Andrews continued to try and sell her fabricated story. The media were fascinated by her. Daily Mirror journalist Rod Chater managed to interview the wannabe model at Birmingham Crown Court on the day of her conviction. I'm sat next to Tracy. I didn't feel threatened, obviously. She's a killer, but we're not in any kind of environment in which she's likely to suddenly launch an attack on me. So I said, well, you know, do you stick to your story? Yes, I stick to my story. Uh, did you kill him? No, I didn't. Just minutes later, Tracy Andrews was given a life sentence for the murder of her own fiance. I worked uh, as a national newspaper journalist for for many years. Uh, I covered thousands of stories, dozens of murders. Some stories just stay with you, and this is one of the ones that stays with me. It's a story that begins over 45 years ago. Tracy Andrews was born on the 9th of April 1969 in the West Midlands. Well, Tracy was brought up just outside Birmingham in Redditch and Alvechurch, and she was the, the middle child. She had an older sibling and a younger sibling and several half-siblings. And her parents broke up when she was around about six years old because they'd had quite a volatile relationship. The separation of her parents in 1975 had a lasting effect on young Tracy. Well, Tracy's parents split up and her mother got married to another man. And when we look at our parents' relationships, they are quite important because they inform our expectations of other people, our expectations of the relationships that we go on to have. Kids need attention, you know, they need to be loved and, and, and cuddled and everything. And a lot of kids that come from those kind of, of broken homes, and the case of Tracy, they want to be loved by mother, father, or somebody. So that is definitely, in my opinion, one of the things that, that pushed her into always wanting the attention of other men. Tracy left school in 1986, and age 21, she had a baby daughter. But the relationship with her partner lasted barely a year, and they soon went their separate ways. What we've got here is a woman who doesn't like her partners having a life that doesn't involve her. She doesn't like her partners going out without her. She gets very jealous, she's very possessive. She certainly had a temper. Everybody who knew her said she had a temper. And when she lost her temper, everybody knew about it. She would shout at the top of her voice. The whole street would hear. By 1994, 25-year-old Tracy was living in a council flat in Alvechurch and working as a barmaid. But her aspirations went far beyond pulling pints. She had visions, she had dreams of becoming a model, but, uh, and, you know, she was very photogenic. She looked good on camera, um, and she knew it, and she had some, some pictures uh, taken and a, a photo album put together, but that never really took off either. She became a barmaid working in a pub, but she still dressed very provocatively and she still uh, loved talking to men and, and chatting to men. Again, seeking the attention that she wanted to get as a model, because obviously when you're that pretty and, and you're a model, you, you do get a lot of attention. Living nearby to Tracy was 23-year-old Lee Harvey. He also had a daughter from a previous relationship. Lee Harvey was a young man from a very close family, um, and he worked as a bus driver for um, West Midlands Travel. So this was a job that involved you know, meeting many people on a, a daily basis. He was, uh, he was very outgoing. Um, he was interested in, in cars and, and was always very well turned out. So he was your, your typical young Birmingham lad, essentially, very close to his mum, very close to his sister. The paths of the two young single parents would soon cross. Well, Lee and Tracy met in October 1994 in Ritzy's nightclub in Birmingham. And this relationship really did develop at a lightning pace. They had moved in with one another only around three months into the relationship. So, so this was going very, very fast. 
And their relationship was quite a volatile one. Um, they were both quite, quite possessive, quite jealous um, when it came to the other's uh, relationships with the opposite sex. And you often find this in relationships that develop very quickly. You haven't got that foundation of trust that's been built. You're always a little bit kind of suspicious as to what the other person's up to because you don't really know them. And they would row and they would fight like cat and dog. And neighbours would report how voices would be raised at all hours of the day and night and would go on and on for hours and then stop and then start again. The couple got engaged after just six months, but their volatile relationship would often see them break up, only to get back together again soon after. It was a may, maybe almost a, a, a carbon copy of what Tracy grew up with in her house. She had a very explosive temper, and um, Lee Harvey also, in a way, didn't, wouldn't like just bow down to her screaming, so he would scream back. She was forever throwing him out into the street and she would throw his clothes out of the window or in a black bin bag and chuck him out the front door, change the locks. And then they would have reconciliations. Lee would go back, more violence, Lee would leave, Lee would go back, more violence. This went on for a period of about two years. Their explosive relationship finally came to a head on December the 1st, 1996. So they'd been rowing all day. Lee tended to be the peacemaker, and it was probably Lee's suggestion, why don't we go for a drink? Why don't we just get a cha change of scene, a breath of fresh air, let's get out of here, let's just go and you know, relax and have a drink. And, and that's what they did. But Lee Harvey would never make it home again. By 11 p.m., he would be dead. The only witness to the fatal altercation was his fiancée, Tracy Andrews. And her version of events would soon make it one of the most talked about murders of the decade. On December the 1st, 1996, 27-year-old Tracy Andrews and her 25-year-old fiancé, Lee Harvey, were at a pub in Bromsgrove in the West Midlands. After arguing all day, the couple were trying to patch things up, but their night was about to turn deadly. Tracy claimed that after they'd left the pub and Lee was driving, that they'd become involved in a, in a road rage incident, um, essentially, that a man in a dark Ford Sierra, there'd been some kind of altercation, and he'd started following them. And she's suddenly aware that this car is behind, lights flashing right on their tail. Lee starts to accelerate, they're snaking together through the lanes. The, the other car then effectively draws Lee to a halt. Tracy later told detectives that the man following the couple along rural Cooper's Hill got out of his car and Lee did the same. A confrontation was inevitable. The driver then has said what he wants to say, apparently. He gets back in the car, Lee is still outside of his car, and then the passenger gets out, uh, a fat man with staring eyes, and he goes up to Lee and attacks Lee in a way that Tracy doesn't quite see. Then she piles in, she says, to go to Lee's defense because she says she's not the kind of girl to just sit there and see her, her man being attacked, at which point she gets smacked by the fat man in the eyes and repeatedly gets up and is knocked down. And then she says, it all gets a bit hazy from that point, and then she kind of comes to almost, and, uh, and Lee's there, and he's covered in blood, and she's cradling him, and uh, it all goes very vague. Lee's car had ended up right outside a house called Keeper's Cottage. The commotion in the road had alerted one of the residents. But the guy made his way down the, the little path, to the road and there sees uh, in poor light, uh, just shown by the security light, but there's a woman standing there with her back to the car. There's a, a body, prone body on the, on, the, on the floor. He instantly 
runs back into the house saying, call the police, call the police, call the, call the ambulance. The case was immediately given to Detective Superintendent Ian Johnston. I received a call from West Mercy Constabulary Operations Room, which directed me to the scene at Coopers Hill, where I met with divisional representatives. Uh, present at that time was uh, Lee's car, Lee's body, and Tracy Andrews was inside Keeper's Cottage, having been found in the road outside. I could see Lee's vehicle. It was pulled in on the near side of the road, travelling towards Alf Church, and it didn't appear to have um, been stopped in any great hurry. It looked as though it had been fairly neatly parked to the side. Detectives at the scene spoke to Tracy to find out exactly what had happened. The incident appeared to have started from the Marlbrook public house. Uh, there'd been a, a road situation down the A38 towards the M42 motorway. Lee's car had been stopped, uh, and then an altercation had taken place between a member of that chasing vehicle and Lee. Lee collapsed. Uh, and then the other vehicle made its, uh, made its escape. Lee Harvey died at the scene. It was clear that he'd been the victim of a savage and frenzied attack. This is a severe, sustained, brutal attack with a penknife. Now, the estimates of how many wounds Lee suffered vary. Some local reports said 42. What is clear, he was stabbed in... Uh, throat, back, front, repeatedly, viciously, and continuously. To produce 42 stab wounds, it's a sustained assault. It's 42 movements of your hand. This is not something that you can do in a second or two seconds in a moment of madness. You have to keep going, and it is not easy. In Lee Harvey's case, the fatal stab wound was a stab wound to the carotid artery. That is, a large artery in the neck and a stab wound to an artery of that size is going to cause very rapid, very heavy bleeding. Without prompt medical attention, it's most likely to be a fatal injury. With an initial statement taken, a bruised and bloodied Tracy Andrews was whisked away in an ambulance. And uh, she's treated for those injuries and for shock in hospital and cared for and tended for while police launch a massive murder hunt for whoever has done this, this terrible thing to Lee. Tracy had told us that the following vehicle, which had uh, followed them from the Marlbrook, was a dark colored Ford Sierra, F registered. And obviously we started a, a vehicle inquiry with the DVLA for the uh, owner details of any vehicle that might fit that description. As reports of the apparent road rage murder reached news desks across the country, journalists immediately headed to the West Midlands. From the very first moment, it was clear that this was going to be a huge story, an absolutely huge story. Just the idea of, of a road rage murder made it already a big story. Um, and as the first morning progressed, everything we discovered made it a bigger story. Photographs began to emerge of Tracy. She looked an attractive young woman. Pho photographs began to emerge of Lee, the victim, handsome young man. And so more and more of the elements that make a big story, young, attractive, bizarre, unimaginable circumstances, all started slotting into, into place. Detectives knew that the best way to try and find the killer was to make an appeal through the media. A press conference was arranged for Tuesday, December the 3rd, two days after the fatal attack. I met Tracy somewhere around about 10 a.m., I believe, just before we were going to do the press conference. I asked her if she was content to do the press conference, if it was something that she wanted to do. She said that she was. She said she really wanted to do it. This hugely hiked up the media interest because we were going to have put in front of us, it was said, the key witness and someone, we'd all seen the pictures by this time, an attractive blonde, and she was going to sit there in front of us and answer our questions. There was massive media interest in this. As the press conference began, all the focus was on 27-year-old Tracy. 
the noise of the uh, cameras, the motor drives going off as Tracy walked in the room was absolutely deafening. Um, uh, and, and appearing in front of us, uh, I don't think we'd all thought what would appear, really, but we'd all seen these glamorous shots. Here was um, a woman, red-eyed, haggard, uh, completely unmade up, two black eyes, cut on her nose. And Tracy did look like a victim. Um, she had the injuries to her face. She looked incredibly distressed, incredibly upset. But Tracy seemed very comfortable when faced with all the camera flashes and questions from the journalists. The press really wanted to hear from Tracy. And so, I, you know, I became a bit of a sideline, really, which was fine. You know, it was about, it was about the story. It was about the uh, the situation, and the press were interested in Tracy, and she was quite happy to to deal with the press. Both me and the other person were like playing cat and mouse with each other for a while, um, and they overtook us. I was shouting at me to, you know, slow down, just ignore them, stop the comedy. I don't know. I don't know if a lot of men are like it, and a lot of women are like it, but um, you get behind the wheel of the car. You know, sometimes you change personality. During the press conference, when talking about the alleged killer, uh, there was a moment when suddenly her eyes came up and she was mostly downcast throughout the press conference, but her eyes came up and they flashed fiercely and her mouth dropped open a bit with that famous slightly jutting draw and she looked really angry. And at that point, again, all the motor drives went off. Every press photographer reacted to that. It was a crash of noise as every camera was, was, was hit. It was just the way he looked. His, his eyes was, they had stary eyes. Um, it just didn't seem normal. I saw the man hit me. I don't know what with. I didn't see anything. And suddenly she starts appealing to the driver of the car, saying, you're not in any trouble, you know, come forward and tell the police what it's all about. Um, whoever this person is that was with you, you obviously know him. Uh, he's ruined my life. Please, just tell us who he is, because you won't get in any trouble at all. It was not your fault. And I'm thinking, well, that's not strictly true, is it? You've driven your friend to the to a murder scene, and he's killed someone, and you've driven him away. So you are in, you are in trouble, but uh, OK. And as the questioning progressed, Tracy seemed to contradict her original statement. I said, Tracy, sorry, but I, I, I clearly understood the police to say that it was about 10 past 10 when you left the pub. And she kind of looked at me, sort of head down under her lashes, and said, no, it was 10 to 10. And sat on her left was Superintendent Johnston. And I just saw him react to that answer from Tracy and very slowly his head turned to the right and he just looked at her in a kind of assessing way, a kind of appraising way. And at that moment I thought, wow, there's something going on here. I just tried to stop the bleeding really and comfort him as much as I could. The inconsistency in Tracy's story surprised the majority of reporters in the room. The press conference finished uh, and the national newspaper journalists gathered outside in a bit of a pack, uh, as, as we would tend to do, all friends all know each other, work against each other, and somebody said, what do you think? And I said, I think she did it. And we all kind of looked at each other and thought, this, you know, this enormous story just got ten times bigger again if, if, she, if she is the killer. Was it really conceivable that Tracy Andrews had been lying all along? As the investigation continued, new evidence suggested that maybe there was no road rage incident at all. 
Andrews would go from the only witness to the number one suspect in the murder of Lee Harvey. On December the 3rd, 1996, 27-year-old Tracy Andrews appeared at an emotionally charged press conference in an appeal to find the passenger of a Ford Sierra who, she claimed, had stabbed her fiancé, Lee Harvey, to death. But unbeknownst to Andrews, the police were beginning to work out the truth that she had been the one responsible for the murder of 25-year-old Lee. It's self-preservation. That's what's driving her behaviour at this point in time. Um, she's got absolutely no empathy whatsoever for Lee or for Lee's family, or indeed for her own family, who are also going to be really badly affected by this. So she's thinking, how do I best preserve myself? I'm going to take that role of the victim and I'm going to put myself in it. Andrews claim that she and Lee had been the victim of a road rage incident didn't seem to add up. A witness statement from a child staying in a house on Cooper's Hill put her version of events in doubt. It was December, the, uh, the windows were closed, but she could clearly hear a row going on. What she remembered was that one was a distinctly male baritone voice. The other voice was much softer and uh, she said it was much more like a woman's voice. Forensic searches of the road had discovered more clues into what really happened. We couldn't get anywhere near the scene on the first morning, or indeed for a, a, a few days afterwards. The police completely sealed it off while they drafted in officers to carry out a fingertip search of the area. What they found we later discovered were a couple of bits and pieces, including a tiny spring and another element from a multifunction uh, pen knife. What police didn't find uh, was any trace of a car overtaking another car on the soft December winter verges of this pretty narrow road. Police had also found a black beanie hat in the hedgerow next to where Lee's car had been parked. So her assumption was, well, this has maybe fallen out of the uh, assailant's pocket and he's not realised it. So, of course, um, that went to the laboratory fairly quickly with a view towards DNA and uh, from hair samples, that sort of thing. And um, we have the report back by the Wednesday that this was animal hair and it was cat hair, black and white cat hair. Well, there's a black and white cat at Tracy's. And so we went down and took a sample of hair from the cat, and it was the cat hair. And then, as I understand it later on, it was accepted that this was Lee's hat, but had been in Tracy's pocket prior to the uh, events taking place. Andrew's lie about the hat was just one of many inconsistencies in her story. In Lee's hand, they found between 80 and 100 strands of a Tracy's hair that have been pulled from Tracy's head as Lee has tried to defend himself. Now, if Lee had been murdered by this, this fat man with staring eyes, why would he have Tracy's hair in his hand? Well, the pathologist's evidence was that this was more than just a, 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 a death grasp stroking, that it was a reasonable clump, that it had a good pull, but of course, Trace's view was, well, this must have been when he was uh, he was going and he uh, he got his hand in my hair, you know. And so it came as a sort of, as Lee was passing away, he'd pulled some hair from her head. It was beginning to look more and more likely that Andrews had killed Lee in a fit of rage. I mean, if you attack somebody that you're supposed to be in love with and stab them 42 times, and that's pretty out of control. She wasn't thinking to herself as she set off from the pub that evening, oh, tonight's the night I think I'm going to kill Lee. She just exploded like a volcano. Over a matter of minutes, literally, she went from mildly angry to obsessively angry, and that, therefore, he had to die. When we talk about premeditated murder, we tend to assume that it's something that's days, weeks, or months in the planning. But actually, premeditation only needs to take seconds. Um, you only need to have a few seconds to decide that you are going to end somebody's life. And, and she made that decision on this evening. 
and it seemed that Andrew's guilty conscience was beginning to get the better of her. On Wednesday, December the 4th, the day after the Telltale press conference, she tried to kill herself. Tracy takes an overdose, and I think this is a, a very deliberate, a very determined act on her part. I think she was absolutely set on ending her own life, because over the past few days, the situation has spiralled completely out of her control. She's trying to keep a story together, she's trying to present this face as the victim, and it's all getting a bit too much because it's starting to unravel. So I think this is an attempt to take back control, to say, actually, I'm going to decide to do something now that I'm fully in control of, and, and that's what this was. On the same evening, detectives were given their biggest steer yet. Two people had seen Lee's distinctive white Ford Escort on the night of his murder. Two witnesses who said, we've seen it in the local paper. I know I've seen this white car. We were driving from Alf Church in the opposite direction. We came through uh, Cooper's Hill, past Keeper's Cottage. We came down the hill. And as we, as we came to the junction at the bottom, I saw this car go past. And he said, it's a white Escort G Reg, spoked wheels, everything that it was. And he said, that, you know, there is no doubt that was the car. He said, and from that point to when we got into Bromsgrove, we saw no car that fits any description of what you've been told and there certainly wasn't any car chasing that car in the vicinity of Cooper's Hill. So we'd got the confirmation that we were looking for that the road rage incident had not occurred. And so that changed the way that we looked at the investigation. Her story really was starting to crumble at that point in time, and combined with her suicide attempt, I think the police decided that's enough evidence. We can now move in and arrest her. On Saturday, December the 7th, 1996, six days after Lee's murder, Tracy Andrews was arrested in hospital and taken into custody. The 27-year-old woman was arrested at 11 o'clock today, but so far detectives have released no further details. Until this development, the police had been looking for two men who they believe may have escaped from the scene in a dark Ford Sierra. The evidence from the two witnesses who'd seen Lee Harvey's vehicle uh, through the junction that night was e extremely impactive. And um, realistically, uh, without a, a following vehicle, without a dark colored Ford Sierra chasing that car, then the whole being of that explanation from Tracy just didn't stand up. Further evidence pointed towards Andrews being the killer after the clothes she was wearing on the night of the murder were forensically tested. The forensic scientist who had examined one of Tracy's uh, zip-up boots, she had a pair of ankle boots on, and within that he'd found a mark in the leather which had a rounded top on it uh, and seemed to bear all the impression of the outside shape of the knife. And that's the uh, hypothesis that she carried the knife away from the scene in her boot uh, and that as soon as she got to the hospital she was able to dispose of it. She could have easily just like thrown the, the knife into the, into the grass or into the, the forest, or whatever it was, um, and hope the police wouldn't find. But she even thought, no, they, these guys are going to bring dogs. They're going to, you know, search the whole area. They will probably find something. Tracy Andrews was officially charged with the murder of Lee Harvey on December the 19th, 1996. Her trial was set for July, and she was going to plead not guilty. Andrews was sticking to her story. The prosecution would have to prove that she was a liar or she could walk away free. On July the 1st, 1997, the trial of Tracy Andrews began at Birmingham Crown Court. The 28-year-old was pleading not guilty to the murder of her fiancé, Lee Harvey, exactly seven months earlier. The media attention surrounding Andrews and the trial was huge. I was at the trial every day at Birmingham Crown Court. Uh, it was compelling, unmissable, and was being widely reported in all the media every day uh, and every evening on all the TV news bulletins. 
The prosecution team, led by David Krigman, were confident that they had a strong case against Andrews, as well as the two witness statements that contradicted her road rage story the blood pattern analysis of her orange jumper was key. She was covered in blood, which she claimed had come onto her clothing when she was comforting him as he died, as she held him in the road. But a lot of this blood was sprayed blood. It was arterial blood that had come out of the carotid in a fountain and sprayed like a waterfall down the front of her clothing. In a lot of cases of stabbing, particularly to the chest or the abdomen, a lot of the bleeding is internal because the large organs and blood vessels are deep within the body. The carotid artery is very close to the surface, so if it's breached, it will spray blood under pressure from the heart out of that wound, out into the air, and it will land on things next to it, in particular, in this case, Tracy Andrews, the assailant. The evidence may have appeared to be compelling, but Andrews herself had already proved to be extremely convincing when under intense scrutiny. I thought she'd done it. I thought she was the killer. But bearing in mind uh, how she'd handled the press conference a couple of days after the murder, I, I thought that she stood a good chance of getting away with it. But as ever, as is always the case, everything would hinge on the cross-examination of Tracy in the witness box, should she choose to give evidence, once the defence began. On Monday, July the 14th, Tracy Andrews took the stand to give her testimony. There was genuine apprehension in the prosecution camp that a jury may be persuaded by not only the story, but the skill, I would say, the skill with which she was able to advance what she had to say. Tracy stood in the witness box now, having moved from the dock, and gave her account, which largely followed the account that she'd been giving to the police all along through her, through her statements, the road rage story, the, the chase through the lanes, and the, the stabbing and the road rage attack. And she gave it calmly and, in some senses, convincingly. Prosecutors knew that the cross-examination of Andrews would be their best chance at cracking her veneer of lies. And it went on and on and on. It went on for hours. It not only took the whole of that afternoon, it took the whole of the next day and into a third day. And in that time, the highly intellectual David Krigman just took her story apart. He just deconstructed it her, around her. She was left there, effectively, naked in the middle of her story, in shreds on the floor. I came to the view that the only way you could dissect her story was piece by little piece by little piece, detail by detail. It was the accumulation of a large number of details where she could be shown not to be telling the truth that could break her down. It was only within the finest of detail, as one mounted on top of the next, that you began to see the story it was a pack of lies. And she was, was reduced to standing there saying, I don't know, I can't remember, I don't know, I can't remember. And at every point, her credibility diminished. And at that point, I thought, OK, I think she's going to get found guilty. On July the 29th, in an unprecedented move, Andrews agreed to be interviewed by a newspaper journalist as the jury retired to make a decision on her fate. She met with Rod Chater in a private room at the court. And there was Tracy, uh, sat there, made up, composed, sat at a table, her lawyers, and I sat down and, and interviewed her. It was absolutely bizarre. Never in 35 years on Fleet Street, never did it before, never did it again, interview the accused while the jury's out. Extraordinary. So I started to ask her questions. Rod had to work fast to get all the information he could. The basic message that she was giving was, 
uh, I didn't do it, I'm innocent, and I'll love him till the day I, I die. And that was, that was the, the message from the exclusive Mirror interview that I did. And I'd been there about 20 minutes and was just beginning to come to the end of the story, just, to, just beginning to kind of think, OK, well, what's the next question? Um, and the tannoy went, and the tannoy went, all parties to court nine, all parties to court nine. You just felt, wow, a jury about, there's a verdict. Rod headed back to his seat in the press box. We kind of went our separate ways and ended up a few feet from each other in court. Uh, and the judge came in, everybody stood up. And the foreman of the jury, will you please stand? Uh, do you have a verdict on which you are all agreed? Uh, yes, we do. What is that verdict? Guilty. Despite the strain that Tracy Andrews must have felt during four weeks in the dock, she didn't even flinch as the jury foreman told her that she was guilty. Even though she kept her head bowed, her face remained impassive, even as the judge said to her, only you know precisely what happened that night, but we all saw the awful consequences. He said he had no option but to send her to prison for life. She showed almost no emotion. She sh shook her head once like that just as in no, or I don't agree, whatever. But that was the only reaction. And she was then led down the steps from the dock into the, the cell area below. She saw her family briefly before she was taken away. They were allowed brief access to her. At that point, she did break down in tears. At that time, she was completely tearful um, uh, and terrified about what was going to happen to her and what awaited her in prison from other inmates. And in public, she had maintained her composure to the last, really, in private. Um, she was terrified. On the 29th of July, 1997, Judge Mr Justice Broccoli sentenced Tracy Andrews to life in prison for the murder of Lee Harvey. She was ordered to serve a minimum of 14 years. Well, when we asked the question, why do we think Tracy Andrews stabbed Lee Harvey? It was because she felt that Lee was hers. He was her possession. This wasn't a relationship that was about love. It was a relationship that was about control and ownership. And in ending somebody's life, you are completely possessing them. And that was what was going on on that evening when she chose to take Lee's life. In April 1999, Andrews finally admitted that her story about a mysterious road rage killer had been completely made up. 21 months after her conviction, in a letter to her solicitor, Tracy Andrews confessed for the first time that she had indeed killed Lee Harvey, but that it was entirely in self-defense. Now, how she could maintain that, given that he had stab wounds in his back and he was bigger than she was, I find that very difficult to believe. But nevertheless, that's what she insisted. Tracy Andrews had gone from a wannabe model to a model prisoner. In July 2011, after serving her 14 years, she was released back into society and ordered not to go within 25 miles of Lee Harvey's family. I think it is absolutely possible for Tracy Andrews to live a normal life. Um, I think if she's come to terms with her offence, if she's addressed those underlying behavioural traits and characteristics, if she's prepared to just keep her head down and, and get on with her life, then, then yes, very much she can do that. And I think she should appreciate that the fact that she's able to do that because murder casts a long shadow and that there are many people who have been affected by this crime, who continue to be affected by it. But she has the opportunity now to ensure that she doesn't cause any more harm to people and that she can make a contribution to society. It's been over 20 years since Tracy Andrews took away the life of her fiance in a brutal and vicious attack. It remains one of the most infamous murders of the 1990s. Violence on this occasion was not the first occasion that she had used violence. This is a woman of cunning, of deceit, and with a vicious temper. 
it's often described as a crime of passion. And I tend not to use that term because I think what we're implying there is that she wasn't in control of her actions, she didn't know what she was doing, this, this rage came over her and she couldn't help herself. I think she knew exactly what she was doing. When you stab somebody 42 times, you are deciding to continue doing this. Your arm is going to be tired. There are going to be opportunities for you to stop and you decide to keep going. That is prolonged ferocity. That's going on and on and on and on. That's not a momentary flash of anger, that's uncontrollable rage lasting a significant period of time. It's a shocking, shocking thought. And the fact that a woman has done it makes it twice as shocking. Tracy Andrews' case will always remain in the public psyche due to her persistent lying, first to the police, then to the world's media, and finally in a court of law. But although she'll forever be remembered for her crocodile tears, it should never be forgotten that she killed Lee Harvey in a horrific and frenzied attack without a shred of remorse, which undoubtedly makes her one of the world's most evil killers. On November the 17th, 2006, police in the German city of Cologne searched the vehicle of a 47-year-old truck driver suspected of murder. What they found inside his cab was a collection of gruesome memorabilia. When they searched the lorry, they found evidence that this was not a one-off act. There were Polaroid photographs of other victims. There were trophies in the lorry. The driver was a man named Volker Eckert. His arrest brought an end to a 32-year career of murder. Eckert was somebody who became much more skilled at committing murder that the longer that his killing went on. So he had access, he had opportunity, and he really honed his killing routine. The police had no idea just how many victims this long-distance serial killer may have claimed. That's what, uh... There will always be the question, were there six dead women, or were there 13, or even 19, or even more? Back then, he was just beginning his brutal career. I was incredibly lucky. Volker Eckert had terrorised Europe for decades and become one of the world's most evil killers. It was a case that spanned five European countries. When 47-year-old truck driver Volker Eckert was apprehended on the 17th of November 2006, the police had no idea of the extent of his history of murder. Eckert had been on the run for two weeks after killing a Bulgarian prostitute in the north of Spain. When detectives searched the cab of his articulated lorry, they found photographs and hair clippings from five women whom he'd abducted and murdered across Europe. Eckert's defense lawyer was Alexander Schmidtgal. He confessed immediately after he got arrested by the police. You have this quite often when you have um, serial killers or when you have people who have a burden carried with them for a long time. It was like a relief for him to speak with someone and to, to tell what he did. Yeah? So it was like a confession uh, in a church for him. Schmidtgal couldn't believe the person he was talking to was the same cold-blooded killer he'd read about in the police files. So you think there's a monster in front of you, but uh, in the actual communication with him, he was a very normal guy. He was like someone selling you life insurance. He was nothing special. Prosecutors wanted to find out what was going on inside the head of Volker Eckert. He was sent off to be assessed by forensic psychologist Professor Norbert Nadopil. He came from prison, guided by two policemen, into my offices. And then he sat with me for, for several hours alone without a policeman and, and without any handcuffs. 
and uh, we had a long and serious conversation sometimes sad sometimes um, for him or frightening events uh, sometimes also um, very nice and 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 personal and and even even sometimes we laughed together Eckert, who lived in the small town of Hof in Germany, had murdered his final victim on November the 2nd, 2006. Local journalist Rainer Meyer remembers the story well. Volker Eckert had um, seine letzte Tat. Um, Volker Eckert's last victim was the prostitute Milena Petrova near Osterich in Catalonia, North Spain. Spanien, Catalonian. He picked her up there and abused her in his lorry. He spent another day driving around. And the morning after, he dumped her at a nearby stone bridge. On the way back from the stone bridge, he was caught on CCTV. Somebody was erecting CCTV cameras, which hadn't been there before, and just to test them, it panned. One of the images it caught was Eckert's lorry. And when the body that he dumped nearby was found, almost the first place the police went was to look at this entirely accidentally caught CCTV imagery, which led them directly to Eckert. Eckert's job took him all over the continent. A Europe-wide search was conducted, and on November the 17th, 2006, detectives found him and his truck at a car wash in Cologne. When they searched the lorry, they found evidence that this was not a one-off act. There were Polaroid photographs of other victims. There were trophies in the lorry. It was perfectly obvious that this was Eckert's lair. Almost every serial killer, in one form or another, has what's come to be known as a lair. And in his case, it wasn't so much a flat or a cottage or a house, it was the cab of his lorry. After his arrest, Eckert immediately confessed to a murderous career that had lasted for over 30 years. It was the beginning of a huge international story. There were five murders, three in Spain, two in France. And from then on, it was a really hot story. As a journalist, you don't have a serial killer very often. And at that point, I tried to get as much information as I could about this person. His story begins over 50 years ago. Volker Eckert was born in the small East German town of Plauen, on July the 1st, 1959. From a very young age, he developed a fascination with women's hair. When he was nine years old, he started to be fond of the doll of his sister, a doll which had long hair, and he put them in front of him on his bed. He was feeling sexual arousal, plunging his hands into the hair of this, this doll. We describe him as a trichophiliac. This is somebody who gains sexual pleasure from, from hair, essentially. Um, and I think he would have been aware of the fact that this was something odd, this was something out of the ordinary. And I think that would have created a bit of a sense of shame within him. So he was aware that this was something that he had to keep hidden. As Eckert entered adolescence, his parents' marriage began to break down. Well, he had quite a turbulent time during his teenage years. His parents divorced and he reacted really badly to this. The separation for him was influential because the father had to leave the house and he said, I swore to myself, that will never happen to me and I will not marry because I don't want to work all the time and then be thrown out of the house. Um, and he took sides with his father after that. But he lived, continued to live with his mother. He went off the rails and, and one incident involved taking his parents' car and, and going off on, on a bit of a joyride. Um, and then he, he returned home and he was in a lot of trouble for that. And it wasn't too long after that incident that, that he actually went and, and physically attacked and, and killed one of his classmates. 
In 1974, aged just 14, Eckert experienced taking a life for the very first time. But it wasn't until his arrest in November 2006, over three decades later, that anyone knew about it. Volker Eckert confessed to killing a classmate and to disguising her murder as a suicide. And that crime was not solved for years, or for almost 32 years. On May the 7th, 1974, Eckert had knocked on the door of his 14-year-old school friend and neighbor, Sylvia Unterdörfel. Realizing her parents weren't home, he took the opportunity of living out the fantasy he dreamed of since playing with his sister's doll as a child. And then he thought, uh, well, I have to do it with a real girl. And he, of course, like, like many fetishists, they realize they won't do it voluntarily with me. So I have to force them. She was somebody who had very long, very beautiful hair, and he developed a real fixation, a real obsession with her hair. And he went to where she lived, her home, and basically wormed his way in. And this girl... First, this girl only played a role in his fantasy, as a victim. But the point came when this fantasy wasn't enough anymore. He wanted to do it. He wanted to stroke her and then kill her. He started right away after she let him in, closed the door, and he started getting at her throat. And started to strangle her. And when she was unconscious, he plunged his hands into her hair. Even as a teenager, Eckert had the sophistication to try and disguise the murder. He strangled her with a, a clothesline, but he was, he was quite cunning because he thought he, he needs to cover this up. So what he did is attach the, the end of the clothesline to a door handle to make it look as if she'd killed herself. It is physically possible to hang yourself from a doorknob. You don't have to have your full body weight on the neck. And it's something that is occasionally seen, although it's uncommon. Just as her mother was getting home from work, she walked in to find her dead daughter. Of course, like with every unnatural death, the East German investigation authorities began their work and came to the conclusion that it was a suicide. It was a suicide. At the end, Eckert managed to set up the scene so cleverly that the police fell into his trap. And for 32 years, right up until Volker Eckert's confession, her parents had lived with the belief that their daughter had taken her own life. The Spanish police were at that point just extremely stolz. At the time, the Spanish police were extremely proud to have uncovered this series of murders. They wanted publicity. They wanted to be congratulated for their success. They needed a pat on the back. And also wanted to show the public that it was all over. Nothing like this would happen again. We've caught this monster of the highway. Eckert admitted to the killings of 21-year-old Nigerian Sandra Osivo in 2001 and Polish national Agnieszka Boss in 2006, both in France. Journalist Francois Barrère could barely believe the scale of the investigation. We realized that we were dealing with someone who'd been traveling the roads of Europe for 10, 15 years, and that this person had possibly committed crimes, certainly in many European countries. A lot of journalists did the same as the police, namely questioning the existence of case files of unsolved crimes that might match Volker Eckert's style of killing. Over the years, Eckert had developed a very familiar M.O. They always started with uh, strangling and uh, that the woman got unconscious, that he felt the power. Um, he always uh, spoke about uh, to see uh, the consciousness go away from the eyes. And he, uh, this, was, this was his attraction, yeah, to have control and to have power over another um, person and um, to have the fetish with, his, uh, with the female hair, with long female hair. He was a man who had 
come to have a taste for strangling the life out of women who were not able to protect themselves. He wasn't a particularly big man, he wasn't a huge strong man, but he was wiry, he was capable, and many of these young women would not have expected to have been treated in this way. Strangling someone, the main thing that happens is that the blood supply to the brain is cut off, and once that's cut off, then you will lose consciousness in the order of 10 seconds. It takes a lot longer to actually die, but you can render someone unconscious very quickly by strangling them. Eckert was somebody who became much more skilled at committing murder the, the longer that his killing went on. So his first murder was quite opportunistic um, and it was somebody that he knew. It was incredibly risky and I think he was very lucky to get away with that. And I think he realised that, that his luck was on his side at that time. And in later years he targeted sex workers because I think there was an awareness there that these people often go off the radar for, for long periods of time. They're a vulnerable group of people who will get into your lorry willingly. So he had access, he had opportunity, and he really honed his, his killing routine. Eckert knew that prostitutes were far less likely to be reported missing immediately, if at all. Lorry driving was the perfect subterfuge for a man who wished to uh, kill women on the edge of society. He wasn't picking uh, famous people, he wasn't picking rich people, he was picking people who no one would miss. I think he had a, a real understanding, uh, a real knowledge of the, the sex worker community, of how transitory it is, of how temporary it sometimes can be. And he realised that this was easy pickings for him. It wouldn't require much effort to indulge his fantasies and get away with it. After his arrest in November 2006, Eckert had confessed to six murders in total. He appeared to have a complete lack of empathy for his victims. He's speaking about uh, tremendous horrible things and uh, details of, of killing or actually sexually abusing other women and uh, there was no, like, there was no fear, there was no shivering, there was no um, turning away of the eyes, there was nothing like a reaction you would expect if, if, if a normal person is telling this. I was always asking how you felt um, when you killed the woman. What, what did you do the day after? Did you look in the newspaper? Did you think to the parents? Did you think to the family of the, of the girls? His, his emotions were missing. He spoke about himself like a monster who was not able to control himself and that he has some defects. He knew this. Although he admitted taking the lives of six women, Eckert still tried to separate himself from the murders. He spoke about himself in a third person, like um, he's building a distance between the uh, Mr. Eckert who is uh, committing the crimes and who is uh, really doing horrible things and the person who is sitting here next to you and speaking with you. So I think this was the, the way for him to, to handle this, yeah, because if to think that the, the uh, person who was committing the crime is someone else, because otherwise you cannot uh, you cannot live. Yeah? You cannot live with this uh, knowing that uh, you are this monster. Detectives believe that Eckert had likely committed many more murders over the previous 32 years. So the investigators are relatively sure that it was probably 13 cases in total, even though it's not possible to prove this 100%. And in a further six cases, there was at least the possibility that it was him because he was driving in the area. Eckert's movements as a long-distance lorry driver were easy to track using fuel receipts, GPS records and details of where he'd spent the night. Investigators from the whole of Europe dug out their old cases and compared them with the movements of Eckert that the police in Bayreuth had mapped out and they tried to find crimes that had taken place when Volker Eckert was driving through this country. Scotland Yard came over to Germany to question, then there was the French police as well, because every police um, knew there is a serial killer. So look at the cases where was a woman sexually abused, um, maybe there this Mr Eckert was nearby yeah, at the time she was uh, killed. 
Investigating officers could link Eckert to the murder of three more prostitutes between 2002 and 2004 based on his movements. One in France, one in Italy, and one in the Czech Republic. Francois remembers visiting a crime scene that bore all the hallmarks of an Eckert murder. This was a prostitute who worked near the entrance to a motorway in Montpellier, who disappeared one day and was found 300 kilometers away in a motorway rest area near Montélimar. That's in the area of going back up north, so in other words, potential routes Volker Eckert could have taken when, for example, he returned from Spain to get back to Germany. And this young woman who had a who was, I remember, because I used to see her on my way to get a newspaper, she had a very thick head of brown hair, and we knew that Volker Eckert actually had a hair fetish. And this young woman was found dead, stripped naked, in a motorway rest area 300 kilometers from the place where she worked. This matched Volker Eckert's modus operandi exactly. He often moved the victims he had abducted somewhere and killed somewhere else, disposing of the bodies tens of kilometers away to cover his tracks. Back then, he also committed several more crimes in Plauen. He waylaid women during the night, threw them to the ground and strangled them, but didn't kill them. 18-year-old Eckert was jailed for a year for sexual assault after he was caught strangling a woman in 1978. But it did not curtail him. Between 1979 and 1987, he assaulted dozens more women. He had attacked several, he talked about 30 women in the dark, so they, they wouldn't recognize him without killing them. Uh, he, he strangled them, he uh, gripped into their hair, and then he went home and, and masturbated. That was for several years, well, more than two at least, and, but uh, he said 30, maybe more, attacks against women like that in his hometown. There are no official records of how many women survived or died after Eckert's attacks. He was finally stopped in 1987 after he assaulted two women in Plauen and left them for dead. Both were able to identify him to police. One of those women, whose name we have changed to protect her identity, is Claudia, who was only 16 at the time. I was on the way home from a party together with my friend. And on the way home, I took her home first and wanted to walk the rest of the way by myself. As I continued to walk alone, I noticed after around 100 metres that somebody was following me. When I walked faster, the person behind me also walked faster, and when I slowed down, also he was slowing down. At that point, I already felt a bit threatened, so I grabbed my bunch of keys, hoping to be able to defend myself. Maybe I could hit him in the face. He suddenly came up behind me at a crossroads and pushed me to the ground. Then he put his hands around my neck and choked me. I then tried to defend myself, but he was stronger heavier, more powerful. I had no chance. I tried to play dead in the hope that he would let go, but that didn't work. He knelt on top of my legs, so there was no chance for me to move anywhere. He was strangling me with his hands. I really struggled to describe it, this pain and the pressure. It was very brutal and incredibly violent. At that moment, I gave up my life. That was it. I knew it was over. I saw a tunnel with a white light at the end of it. It was really like that, a near-death experience. Incredibly, Claudia survived the attack and was able to give a detailed description of her attacker to the police. To this day, 
I still can't forget his face. Eckert had applied to leave communist East Germany behind and move to the freedom of the West. But when a drawing of Claudia's description of his face was distributed amongst the police, an officer recognized him and he was immediately arrested before he could flee the country. The day of his court hearing arrived, when he was about to be convicted. He was sitting only a few meters away from me, and suddenly he apologized to me. For me, well, there can be no excuse for a crime like this. In 1988, Eckert was sentenced to 12 years in prison for attempted murder. During his time behind bars, he underwent therapy for his sexual deviance, which the prison authorities saw as a success. The doctor or the psychologist who saw him was very certain that Volker Eckert could control his sexual urges from then on. And this was apparently supposed to have been ensured as he was supposed to undergo more therapy when he made it out of prison. But he didn't do it. Unbelievably, Eckert served just six years of his sentence and in 1994 he was released into the world yet again. And he headed straight for the woman who put him behind bars. One night, he was standing in front of my door. He rang the bell wearing a boiler suit, one of these blue ones, and said, there is a burst pipe, you must let me in. I had a little peephole in the door, a tiny little hole where I could look through, and there I recognized him. I did not open the door, but I know it was him. He tried to find me. I don't want to know what he wanted to do with me. Now it's over, thank God, but he definitely wanted to attack again. By 1994, the Berlin Wall had fallen and Eckert was free to travel wherever he wanted. After he got out of prison, he was able to slip through the net of the authorities. He was able to uh, give them as much as they wanted, but not too much to uh, see that there's a dangerous person who is uh, still dangerous for the society, who is still running through life with this, uh, yeah, let's call it disease, with these uh, criminal obsessions. I felt sorry for the women, because while he had been in prison, Psychologists and other similar professionals would have actually realized that he was still a danger to society. But because of the reunification of Germany, he was released, and nobody seemed to care. Even though he was a tried murderer, he was let go without any sort of assessment, and the women could all still be alive if only someone had acted differently. Eckert settled in the small town of Hof, just 20 miles from Plauen. So he had landed on his feet in Hof and settled in well and was well liked. His landlady also said she had rarely encountered such a nice tenant and everyone was completely flabbergasted when they found out just what sorts of crimes Volker Eckert had committed, despite everyone considering him to be a nice guy. By 1999, 40-year-old Eckert had taken a job as a long-distance lorry driver, a profession that suited the killer perfectly. It allows them to go off the radar for quite extended periods of time. They work unsupervised, they don't answer to anybody, and they have these long stretches of time to, to ruminate and to, to basically get lost in, in their own thoughts. So that creates an environment in which their fantasies start to become a reality. And then when they do offend, we often find that, that they can dump the bodies of their victims in a completely different police jurisdiction to the one that they pick them up in. And that creates something called linkage blindness within the police who are investigating these crimes. They don't always connect them immediately. When police finally caught up with him in 2006, Eckert's truck was like a shrine to his victims. Photos and hair clippings had been collected in his cab. They were his trophies, if you like, along with hair and various other things. They represented for him the reason. The body itself was disposable, but that memory and that lock of hair or locks of hair were his explanation to himself about why he was doing it. 
That was what he was there for. He also made notes of the details of each crime on the back of these Polaroid pictures so that he could later remind himself of what had happened in each attack. He kept the prostitute's hair in little plastic bags, having cut it off after the crime. He kept items of clothing, but the owners of some items of clothing still haven't been determined today. What caught our attention straight away was the fact that the killer was a fetishist. In other words, this was someone who kept souvenirs of their crimes, who took things from their victims, including locks of hair, things like that, keeping things, souvenirs, fetishes, keeping them in a kind of, like some kind of treasure. He is the kind of character you don't find too often in European crime stories. And in this case, we were almost imagining a, a film character. He created a, a little repository, essentially. And this is something that's quite common for, for serial killers, and it, it serves several functions for them. So it enables them to relive their crimes, to, to revisit that, that moment when they were all powerful and, and fully in control. But it also acts as a bit of a stimulus to, to do it again. Um, so it really is a, a vicious circle when it comes to trophies. Most criminals get rid of any evidence that could link them to their victim. This guy, he kept it all. And that alone is something you hardly ever see in criminal cases. Prosecutors had sent Eckert to be assessed by forensic psychologist Professor Norbert Niedopil, and the killer seemed to open up during the sessions. In the end, he said, well, for several months, I was very withdrawn in myself. Now I could even laugh and I was freer. He said, I'm glad to talk to you. I, the three or four days that we were together, he said, I, it was, I slept better, I, I talked better, I, I was more relaxed than, than usual. Professor Naderpil analyzed Eckert's psychological condition for the upcoming court case. The actual conclusion is that he is psychiatrically a sadist, a sadism developed from fetishism, and this, in the legal sense, is a, a mental disorder, and uh, this mental disorder would lead to a diminished responsibility concerning the sexual acts, but not the killings that have been done to prevent detection, and that he would be a repeat offender and if released, even after a prison sentence, would not stop it. He was really preoccupied with what other people thought of him, and he was being portrayed in a way that he didn't think was fair. He's been committing these crimes for, for over 30 years, and I think he's developed quite a grandiose sense of self. And when he's reduced to the label of a monster, he's really not happy about that at all. For local journalists in Horf, the trial of this perverse killer due to take place in the local courthouse was set to be a huge story. Every headline is good for a newspaper, and every spectacular story is good for a newspaper. And it isn't the newspaper's fault that it interests people. But everything that isn't normal stirs people. And if someone living in a community finds out that the nice uncle was not actually the nice uncle that everyone thought he was, but a perverse serial killer, then that stirs people too. And then they want to know as much as possible about it. And we are there for the purpose of delivering that information. Diese Information zu liefern, dafür sind wir da. While waiting for his trial in custody, Eckert had lost the support of his family. I remember very well, he was very uh, desperate that he had uh, completely lost the contact to his family because uh, his sister was always a very um, important um, point of uh, contact for him through his whole life and um, she didn't want to have contact with him. He was sitting inside his cell in the prison of Bayreuth and had a lot of time to think. On his 48th birthday, the 1st of July 2007, 
He knew that he would be officially charged with murder within the next few days. Nobody came to see him that day. His sister didn't visit and neither did his brother. It all became too much for him. On the night of his 48th birthday, July the 1st, 2007, Volker Eckert was left alone in his cell. The following morning, his body was found hanging from the bars. He was all alone, and during the night he brought justice to himself and hanged himself in the cell. It would seem rather strange that here we have somebody who was obsessed with harming other people by strangulation, and he makes a decision to take his own life by the same means. And it is a way to end your life when you're in prison, and it's not difficult to get hold of items to, to achieve that outcome. Eckert's death meant he would escape justice. It came as a surprise to the people who got to know him better than most. I talked to him about suicide at several occasions, and he said, several times, I'm a coward, I won't do it. Um, um, but I know that I have no chances. If you ask me how I feel about him, I, um, I cannot say I, I like him. But you are a human being, and you are in contact with this man. I never see him killing someone, I only read this. But you have contact, you see him twice, three times a week, and you, you see how he's reacting, and you, you feel how all the, the court, all the authority of the state um, is, is against him, how the press is calling him a, a monster, a murderer. In this way, he doesn't deserve this treatment also in the public. And um, he deserves, for sure, uh, a fair trial and um, to defend him as best as, as you can. And, and I felt sad when I heard that he uh, killed himself because you develop a relationship also with your clients in, in prison, especially when you take over the case for such a long time. You develop a relationship. And, and he ended this in a way that uh, yeah, like he ended other lives, he ended his own life himself. Claudia, who survived a brutal attack by Eckert in 1987, had been planning to attend his trial. When I got a call from a journalist telling me that Volker Eckert had killed himself, my first thought was, coward a coward who is dodging responsibility for the gruesome acts he committed. After a considerable amount of time, I was then running out of accusations. I had come to terms with the situation and was even glad that he had killed himself because this gruesome human could no longer hurt anyone. On the one hand, I believe it was simply the best solution and the fairest solution. As if he wanted to say, I'm taking my own life, just like the lives I have already taken. But on the other hand, a lot of things that haven't yet been explained will never be clarified. There were many questions still to be asked about Volker Eckert's crimes. His death means they will remain unanswered. I had a feeling of frustration above all. I knew that Volker Eckert's death meant the end of any investigations that could have been reopened on the old case files that no one was interested in anymore and which had only reappeared in police and media news. In the end, these mysteries would never be solved. And that is what's truly shocking about the death of Volker Eckert, that those victims will never be granted justice. In December 2007, five months after his death, police closed the file on Volker Eckert. The Europe-wide investigation was over. He could remember many of his crimes very well, and indeed very precisely. Surely that would have been a massively exciting trial for the press, and of course also for the readers, who would have wanted to keep up with the news. The trial would have taken months, with enormous coverage from international media. 
because the crimes had been committed across half of Europe. Just how many helpless women were killed at the hands of Eckert may never be known. I'm quite sure that uh, there was no gap of time where he didn't do anything. So, because he always spoke about himself as someone who is not able to control the desire and the, his obsession. So, if you ask my personal opinion, I think there's a high percentage that he did more than uh, he's, he admitted to. Yes. There will always be the question whether six dead women, or whether 13, or even 19, or even more. He has taken this mystery with him forever. There have been estimates of 22 across Europe, France, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Spain. He was relentless and he was successful in evading the attentions of the police for a very considerable period of time. The shadow of Volker Eckert remains not just over the women he murdered, but also the ones that got away. There will always be a part of me that will probably never forget. I can't imagine it. I experienced it. I know what I had to go through. Volker Eckert was a relentless, predatory serial killer, preying on vulnerable women. He took pleasure in it. He took a great deal of sexual satisfaction from it. He was a man who deserves the epithet evil. Eckert was a callous murderer who showed no remorse for his actions. He took the life of a 14-year-old girl for his own gratification before embarking on a 32-year-long killing spree. It will never be revealed exactly how many young women he murdered. By cowardly taking his own life, Volker Eckert robbed many families of justice and proved himself to be one of the world's most evil killers. For three decades, a relentless serial killer was targeting women across the industrial heartland of West Germany. Between 1955 and 1976, he confessed to killing at least 14 victims, the youngest of them a four-year-old girl. But the authorities had no idea. The fact that he got away with this for so long, I think we should really ask ourselves a lot of questions. How does somebody like this go under the radar for that long? He killed with such stealth that others were blamed for his murders. Everyone kept saying he was the alleged child murderer and that drove my father to his death. In 1976, the police captured the actual killer, a 43-year-old man named Joachim Kroll. He demonstrated how he'd killed his victims in a series of chilling reconstruction pictures. In my view, Kroll is among the most depraved serial killers we've seen in Europe in the 20th century. Joachim Kroll, the man dubbed the Duisburg Cannibal, had carved his place in history as one of the world's most evil killers. It was a series of murders that shocked the whole of Germany. For 21 years between the mid-1950s and the mid-70s, Joachim Kroll murdered at least 14 people by strangling them to death. His youngest victim, Marion Ketter, was just four years old. The discovery of her dismembered body in the summer of 1976 left the nation in a state of complete disbelief. For years, Kroll took care to strike away from his home in Duisburg, a town in the Ruhrgebiet, West Germany's industrial heartland. But Marion Ketter lived right on his street. Police were knocking on doors, searching for the missing four-year-old girl in July 1976, when they made a gruesome discovery. Bernd Jaegers was a young detective on the Duisburg murder squad. 
ganze Sache ist auch nur deswegen aufgefallen, weil er Achim ein The whole thing was only discovered because Achim took a girl from the neighborhood. Before that he would travel further and the crime scenes were far away from Duisburg. That is the reason why it took us so long to catch him. This time he took a girl from the neighborhood who we knew by sight. He took her to his flat, sexually abused her and then killed her. When a four-year-old goes missing, the alarm bells go off everywhere. Of course, you use a lot of personnel to try and find this girl. And when we got there, other colleagues were already on the scene. And we then went inside the flat and experienced something terrible. The story of this twisted killer begins more than 80 years ago. Joachim Kroll was born on April the 17th, 1933, the sixth of nine children. His family lived in Upper Silesia, in the far east of Germany, until they got driven out at the end of the Second World War. Uh, Joachim Kroll was the son of a coal miner, born in East Germany, weakly, unprepossessing child, barely intelligent, he had an IQ of 79. They lived in very cramped circumstances, only two rooms for a family of 11, always in financial difficulties. And also his relationship with the family weighed heavily on him because he was hardly able to develop any kind of close relationship with his siblings. Joachim Kroll was lonely in his own family because he learned that he didn't matter much as a human. He didn't experience any motherly or fatherly love at home and therefore couldn't develop a feeling of self-worth. He was withdrawn and shy. He was afraid to even speak because he was physically abused. He was a bit of a victim, a bit of an outcast, even within his own family. And then when he went to school, he didn't really fit in there either. He had quite a low IQ. He wasn't particularly bright. He was a bit slow. So that made him a bit of a target there. And then later on, he was drafted into the, the Hitler Youth. You know, perhaps his, his father thought this was a way of, of sorting him out and making him, you know, a real man. Um, but that, that didn't really work out either um, because he didn't fit in with, with that particular culture. So here's somebody who's always been something of an outsider, somebody who doesn't always fit in, who, who isn't really accepted anywhere. Als die Rote Armee kam, when the Red Army came, all the Germans were driven out. And for the Kohl family, it was an odyssey, because they went from place to place to find another home somewhere. Kohl had to watch women being raped, people being killed, how small boys played with explosives and blew themselves up in the process. So, as a young man, Joachim Kroll had already been badly traumatized. You have to bear in mind that Achim had always been teased and bullied. Even in his own family, he was always the loser. When one of them did something, his siblings would always say, Achim did it, so he would be beaten again. There's quite a, a few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle falling quite neatly into place here um, for, for Kroll. So he started off um, life as an outsider, not really got many decent social relationships, he's quite isolated, and he's, he's somebody who is becoming increasingly introverted, and that's always a dangerous thing. While working on farms as a teenager, Kroll was regularly beaten by his superiors whenever he made a mistake. He went to work on a farm, quite, quite a tough environment. He didn't get on particularly well socially in, in this environment. He worked with people on the farm. Uh, this included women um, who he would make inappropriate passes at because he just didn't have the social skills to, to form normal relationships with the opposite sex. He was quite aggressive in his approach to them. So he was often rejected by the women that he would try and, and develop relationships with. And I think that, that served to just isolate him even further. During his time on the farm, Kroll also developed a morbid fascination with the butchery of animals. 
Back in those days, slaughtering animals on farms isn't the kind of cold clinical approach that's taken today. It was incredibly brutal, it was incredibly bloody. He wasn't repulsed by these, these scenes of, uh, of gore and, and, and blood and, and violence that, that other people might be. Als er zum ersten Mal das Schlachten eines Schweines ähm, beobachtet. When he saw a pig being slaughtered for the first time, it had a lasting effect on him. He started sweating, his pulse was racing. It was basically a very positive and almost ecstatic experience that he didn't expect to feel. He was completely overwhelmed by these sensations that were totally unknown to him. In die er unvermindert hineingeschleudert wurde, weil Joachim Kroll so etwas ja vollkommen fremd war. So he's a bit different and he's developing a tolerance to, to violence and to death. Kroll's delight in the blood and gore of the slaughterhouse even manifested into sexual acts with animals. In der Pubertätzeit, when er war in der Pubertät, als er bei den Bauern war. If fantasies of sexual violence develop during puberty, and he was in puberty, when he was working on farms, then you can never get rid of them. There he experienced these sexual things which aroused him, the warm blood, and where he satisfied himself. Then afterwards he lived out his fantasies on the animals with sexual acts, with cows and anything that was available. And something like that will never go away. When we look at sex, we look at what is it, what does it represent? Essentially it represents power. Now here's somebody who hasn't had a lot of power, who hasn't had a lot of control over the things that have been happening in his life. But when he's involved in the slaughtering of animals, he's fully in control in this situation. And this is something that, that he quite enjoys. It's the first time, I think, in his life that he's got control over what's going on. Kroll's fantasies translated into behavior that was becoming more and more grotesque. When he lived in a hostel for single men and he took a cat into his room, he had this idea that he wanted to see what the insides look like. He took a hammer, struck the cat and skinned it and took a closer look at its intestines. And that really does show this kind of childlike curiosity that he's got and the complete lack of boundaries around how to behave appropriately. His violence towards animals took a more human-like turn when Kroll began experimenting with blow-up dolls. Because Kroll didn't manage to get access to women, he procured himself several rubber dolls instead, which he draped with clothing, but then also hanged them with a rope and imagined that the women would then die. He got a particular kick out of that. It was only a matter of time before Kroll's perverse behavior would lead him to kill. When he was arrested three decades later for the gruesome murder of four-year-old Marion Ketter in July 1976, the police found communication with Kroll extremely difficult. Well, we just simply thought if someone does something like this, other things or fantasies must have played a part. Kroll was so withdrawn, the police decided he might open up more if just one detective tried to form a rapport with him. I said to our boss I would like to talk to Aki Malone. So the two of us sat down in the interview room and I tried, with absolute mundane and trivial subjects, to get through to him. To get through to this man now was, of course, not easy. I then tried with something we found out through interviews with his neighbors, that he would often work on the moped that he owned, that he would fix it and adjust it, that he also repaired his own television. And so I tried to go down this route, and all of a sudden I noticed that he realized, someone's listening to me, when I talk about myself and is actually asking questions. And that was the moment when trust was gradually built up, where I was fortunate enough to kindle a spark of trust, and so he also discussed other things with me. It's a good thing to have him a little bit of faith that he also talked about the other things with me. Kroll was ready to talk to the police. They had no idea that the quiet man sitting before them was responsible for the barbaric killing of at least 14 people over the past 21 years. His confession would stun the whole of West Germany. As detectives continued with their interrogations, Kroll began to open up. My colleague Bernd Jägers had everything right. 
My colleague Bernd Jägers did it all the right way. He's the one who broke the ice. Because without his special relationship with Kroll, all these murder confessions would probably never have been possible. So therefore, he deserves the very highest respect. He gave Kroll the feeling, I don't see you as a beast or man-eater, but just as a human being, and that's exactly how I'll treat you. Let yourself go, do that. And Kroll did that. And then day after day, he confessed to new murders. Kroll told detectives he'd committed his first murder when he was 21 years old in February 1955, just three weeks after the death of his mother. The murderische Karriere von Joachim Kroll begann kurz nachdem Joachim Kroll's murderous career started when the only person he could relate to, his mother, died. His mother was, above all, the most important person in Kroll's life, in contrast with his father, who beat him regularly. She was the only positive figure in his life. He looked up to her and didn't have to be afraid. So when this pillar broke, there was no hope to his sexual pathological development. Ähm, dann gab es also auch für seine sexualpathologische Entwicklung kein Halten mehr. The victim was 19-year-old Irmgard Striel. Kroll had attacked her in the town of Ludinghausen, an hour's drive northeast of Duisburg. So he sees this woman and he tries to make a pass at her, to, to grab her and, and kiss her. And, and understandably, she, she doesn't react well to this. Das hat ihn so stark that rejection belastet. stunned him so much that he thought, I'm a human being and I want to live my sexuality, so I have to find another way. And so violence was the only solution. As a result, he, he kind of shuffles her off into the woods where he, he sexually assaults her and he kills her and then he, he mutilates her, her body. So this is somebody who appears to be, you know, kind of subhuman in a way. When we put his first murder in context, the, the only way that he's felt powerful and that he's felt in control is when he's been killing animals on the farm. So when he, he kills his, his first victim, this is another exercise of power. It's another exercise of control. But what's particularly important about this one is that he's crossed a line. He's killed a human being. He's killed an individual. And I think this is a line that he will cross time and time again. Kroll began to confess to a murderous career that had lasted for the previous 21 years. He had developed a familiar M.O., sneaking up behind people and strangling them to death. Kroll was one of the few people who almost fulfilled the stereotype of a serial killer. He did have slightly staring eyes and a small, rather weaselly, rat-like face he tended to be furtive in all his movements. He targeted women, but they had to be inert. Well, the only way that Kroll could be assured that his female victims were inert was to kill them. He would strangle them rapidly, often by surprise, usually in isolated places. He was the sort of chap you probably would have wanted to cross the street to avoid. The main effect of strangulation is that it blocks the blood supply to the brain and it blocks the blood coming back from the brain to the body. That's far more immediately damaging than pressure on the windpipe or blocking off the air supply. So once you've blocked the blood supply to the brain, once the arteries aren't supplying it with blood, you've literally got about 10 seconds before you lose consciousness, so it's quick. As Detective Bernd Jaegers continued with his daily interrogation of Kroll, the story began to captivate the German press, who dubbed the killer the Duisburg Cannibal. His nickname at one point was the Ruhr Cannibal, or the Ruhr Hunter, because he regularly boasted in the wake of his capture that he uh, ate the victims. He said it was the only meat he could eat. You have to explain that back then there were all kinds of stories published in the press, wild stories, none of which were true. Let's say the Bild Zeitung published interviews word for word in the newspaper, but we never actually talked to the Bild Zeitung. 
They publish such things as, now Achim Kroll is being given cake or potato fritters, so they will confess to the next murder. This is, of course, total nonsense. Now we were there every day, also at the weekends, in order to keep Joachim's spirits up. So I just asked him, what would you like to eat? Which is quite normal. He would say, I would like a piece of cake. Then, of course, we would go and get cake. But that was just about being human and not to get a murder confession. No one would confess to murder because of that. Das muss man sich ja vorstellen. Um, in den Medien wird You have to imagine, Kroll is built up in the media as a monster, a man-eater, a cannibal, and then the police go and serve him with his favorite food. In the end, it was also just a tactic to get Kroll to talk. And using these means has to be allowed. Um sprechen zu bringen. Und diese Mittel müssen dann erlaubt sein. Having gained the confidence of Kroll, the police got a clear insight into the perverse fantasies that ultimately motivated him to commit his appalling crimes. He needed this killing. He needed this seeing how to kill, and that gave him sexual gratification. But the corpses in themselves no longer interested him. He just left them. He did not cover them up, nothing at all. And then he got the bus or train or whatever home in a completely normal way. Kroll tended to, to minimize his behavior, and as criminologists, we call this techniques of neutralization. So rather than describing them as the horrendous things they are, he described them as his funny feelings, you know, something that was a bit of a, a quirk, uh, something that was a bit odd. So he's minimizing what he's doing by describing it in that way. Between 1955 and 1976, Kroll told detectives that he'd killed at least 14 people and that he could take them to some of the crime scenes. Officers decided to drive him to a series of cold case locations throughout the Rugabit region. They hoped by allowing him to reenact the murders, it may help them identify his unknown victims. The police captured photographs of these macabre reconstructions. We as interrogators had no files, nothing at all. We drove behind them, they stopped somewhere, then Akim got out and we asked, Akim, have you been here before? And if he recognized something, then he said, yes, I have been here before. He then looked at it all and went with us into the forest, depending on what crime scene it was. He then could describe how it had looked at that time. That was incredible, he had a photographic memory. He did not know where he was, but he just had this photographic memory. Kroll would try and identify a specific tree or shrub, but he couldn't always find what he was looking for. We would find a few places where a forest used to be, but now there were high-rise buildings. Then he didn't know anymore and he said, I'm sorry, I can't say if I was here. I don't know. Of course, this was sometimes frustrating, but you have to live with that after such a long time. Kroll took the police to the town of Essen, half an hour's drive from his home in Duisburg, where he told them how he killed 61-year-old Maria Hetgen outside of her house in 1969. He walked around the lake all day. It was nice weather and had this feeling. It slowly turned to dusk and he wanted to go home, but then he saw the old lady whom he immediately addressed and said, do you want to have sex with me? She did not want to, of course. He snatched her and pulled her into a wooded area, and then he killed her there. He doesn't seem to have a particular victim type, which is something that we do tend to see in serial killers. So this could suggest that his crimes are completely opportunistic, that he's not consciously targeting a, a particular group of people. Using the information gathered in these fact-finding missions, the police were able to piece together Kroll's history of murder. We konnten also nur von dem, was Achim Kroll uns bei der Rekonstruktion gezeigt hatte. We could only use what Akim Kroll told us during the reenactment, during the interrogation. And we would ask a few questions about whether or not anything more had occurred. Or we asked, Akim, what did you do then? What happened then? Questions like that. These answers convinced us that he is not inventing this stuff and that he really wants to get it off his chest. After spending three months with Akim and looking into more than 100 cases, at some point the defense said, 
That's enough. Akim Kroll will no longer go into the car with the police. So we could not continue to go to all the unsolved crime scenes. This may have also resulted in solving other unsolved cases. That was a shame. As new crimes were revealed to detectives, they soon realized that Kroll was confessing to murders that had already been solved. Some of these innocent men who had been wrongly accused were in prison, and some had even ended up dead. He had confessed to the murder of 14 people and led detectives to the location of many of the crime scenes. One of these victims was 13-year-old Yuta Ran. Kroll had strangled and killed her in the town of Breitscheid in 1970, six years before his arrest. But in a time before DNA evidence existed, the police had focused their investigation on Yuta's boyfriend. For the police, and also for the prosecutor, the matter was resolved. And because of that, it was not on the list. And then Achim went with us into the forest and explained what he had done. This was the first story where we then said, hey, we have somebody here who is in the know. We're not here with somebody who is not quite so clever. He wants to show us what he's done. And now we have a crime for which someone else has almost been sentenced. And he has another 20 to 30 people that he might have killed. A blood group classification expert later confirmed that Yuta's boyfriend could not have been the perpetrator, and he was acquitted. But he was not the only man who had been mistakenly accused of a Kroll murder. One man had even made a false confession about killing 16-year-old Manuela Connaught, who was in fact murdered by Kroll in 1959. After some time, this man went to the police and told them that he killed this girl. He really went to prison for the crime, but then said during his trial, it wasn't me. I only said that because I had financial problems, family problems. I was on the street. I needed somewhere to go and confess to this crime. It was, of course, no longer treated as an unsolved case by the police. The case had been closed. It had come to a trial and he had been convicted. Following Kroll's arrest in 1976, the convicted man wrote an astonishing letter which was published in the press. This man had already turned to our boss of the murder squad. He wrote a letter then saying that he was not the perpetrator and that the perpetrator must still be walking around free. We went to that scene, to the crime scene, and Akim got out and said, yes, I was here too. He went into the forest and again looked for a very specific bush and a specific place, and he said, here it was, and we immediately did a reconstruction. So that was the second story, where an innocent person had served time in prison and the matter was considered as solved. Another man who was falsely accused was Walter Kvicka, a farmer from Walsum, a suburb of Duisburg. He lived less than a mile from the spot where 11-year-old Monica Tafel was killed in June 1962. The young girl happened to be out and about that day and bumped into Joachim Kroll, who was out looking for a new victim to kill and rape. Without the slightest hesitation, he kept turning around to check if anyone could see him, approached the girl, dragged her into a field, strangled her and then sexually assaulted her. But in 1962, Joachim Kroll was just a phantom. And a few days after the brutal killing of Monica Tafel, the police arrested Walter Kvicka. His daughter Marlies was just six years old at the time. Man had uh, my father verdächtigt, 150 meters from his elder house. My father was suspected of raping and murdering an 11-year-old girl 150 meters from his family home.
People who lived in the area, and also from among his acquaintances, made claims, expressed suspicions which the police reacted to. And I think it was five days after the child's body was found, they arrested him at his workplace. No one could have seen him, because on the day of the disappearance, he was at work. So in that sense, he also had a kind of alibi. He was accused, and I know that some people who were very close to me made negative comments about my father. The murder of Monica had left the community in a state of shock. People were keen to keep their children within sight because no one knew where the killer lived or when he'd strike again. This created an oppressive atmosphere in the area and at the same time, people voiced their suspicions. One person suspected the next. It was a hard time for everyone. And no one insisted that it wasn't him. The accusations were there. Apart from my mother, she always said it wasn't him. Walter was only held in police custody for a few days before being released without charge. But people in the area continued to see Marlies's father as the killer. So after he was released, people avoided him and people called out behind him, murderer and stuff like that. It was the case that people really avoided him in the area. Just six months after his arrest, the false accusations became too much for Walter to take. Am 10. December had er abends das Haus verlassen. On the evening of the 10th of December, he left the house, and that was the last time he was seen. On the 15th of December 1962, he was found hanging from a tree by some children. Ich habe das mit neun Jahren richtig kapiert, was vorgefallen war. Und es hat mich. I was nine years old when I really grasped what had happened. And it appalled me. It touched me inside. And I often stood and looked at the spot where the girl was murdered. Wo das Mädchen ermordet wurde. When Kroll confessed to the murder of 11-year-old Monica Tafel following his arrest in 1976, it came as a huge relief to Marlies. But in a way, Walter Kavika had become yet another victim of Joachim Kroll. Es kam der Ausspruch meiner Großmutter, dann war er es ja doch nicht. Dieser Ausspruch hat My grandmother came out with the remark so it wasn't him after all. This remark affected me very deeply, and I didn't ever discuss it with anyone else because I had to process the fact that the pressure of being the daughter of a suspected murderer had disappeared. Tochter eines angeblichen Kindermörders zu sein, verschwunden war. Für mich galt war es so: Mein Vater war rehabilitiert. My father had been rehabilitated. I don't know what other people said about that afterwards. I only know what I heard and what I felt myself. And that's the only thing that counted for me. Before Kroll was arrested, a whole series of other men came under suspicion as part of the investigations. And that is, of course, particularly tragic because these were always men who, at the end of the day, had nothing to do with the crime. Kroll saw no problem with that. Oh, that's, that's their problem. That would be their difficulty. I can get away with it. And to get away with it for 21 years, so consistently, with so many deaths, in such a small area, is horrifying, but also remarkable. In total, two men were falsely accused or imprisoned and three men committed suicide in relation to Kroll's murders. 
another five victims of the callous killer. After his arrest in July 1976, it appeared to detectives that Kroll was almost relieved to be captured. He wanted this sensation gone, which had always led him to commit these crimes. So he really felt the need, and he thought that when he told his story, that it would go away somehow. In terms of what Kroll expressed about his punishment, it is quite childlike and quite immature in a way, because he thought that he would just go to hospital and his funny feelings would be cured and then he'd be able to go home. So this implies quite a, a kind of simplistic interpretation of, of his own problems. But Joachim Kroll could not make these murders simply disappear. He would have to face justice for his crimes. Kroll may have gone on to kill many more women, but one costly mistake had led to his capture, and a gruesome discovery in his home had stunned the country. He presented to the world as friendly, plausible, agreeable to his neighbors in Duisburg. The local children would visit him, although I think sometimes their parents must have been a little suspicious. He was known as Uncle Joachim. We also tried to speak to those around the neighborhood, asked who knows him, who had contact with him. People said he was a bit weird, a bit odd somehow, but he was dear old Uncle Akim, and in reality, he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Behind this facade of Uncle Joachim and, oh, I like to look after you girls and I'm boys and they come round to see me and I'll give them sweets, was this man who was very, very angry, who wanted to make society well aware that they were living by a thread and he could cut it at any moment that he chose. Kroll usually did his killing miles away from his Duisburg home. But in July 1976, Suffering with a bad leg, he finally struck within his own community when he kidnapped and murdered four-year-old Marion Ketter. It was the mistake that led to his capture. His crime scenes got closer and closer, and therefore it was the dumbest thing he could really do, was take a girl from the direct neighborhood. But as I said, his feeling was greater, and if he had thought about it, he should have said, this, what I am doing now, is nonsense they will catch me. Door-to-door -door questioning throughout the neighborhood led the police directly to Kroll. Inside his home was an horrific crime scene. Detectives found a saucepan on the stove with body parts in it. Worse still were the contents of the refrigerator. There was this girl, completely dismembered, upper arm, forearm, placed on corresponding shelves, so that he only had to take something out and add it to the pan. That was unfathomable for us. When we look at cannibalism, we're, we're essentially looking at, at those who consume the, the bodies of, of other humans. And this is, is something that we do see sometimes in, in cases of, of serial murder. And it is about power and it's about control again. It's about completely possessing your victim. So not only have you taken away their, their life, you're now mutilating their body and consuming it. Kroll disposed of other parts of the body by flushing them down the lavatory. But that blocked the toilet, and that of his neighbor below as well. The neighbor approached him and said, hey, something is blocked here. One of the horrifying things of Kroll's crimes was that he took pleasure in taking out the intestines of his victims. And, uh, He'd told a neighbor who was asking him what the smell was. He said rather flippantly, oh, it's guts, uh, which it literally was, intestines. And the neighbor complained. Kroll was nothing if not brazen. Kroll claimed he had butchered a rabbit and would make sure the remains were removed from the pipe. He did that too, and he took it to the waste bins in the courtyard where he disposed of it. He was seen by this neighbor, who then told our colleagues who were walking around asking questions, who has seen this girl last? This neighbor told them of his observations. And so they checked the waste bin and found that this was not from a rabbit, but that they were human innards. Kroll had kidnapped and murdered the helpless four-year-old just days before. 
Er fühlte sich zu diesem jungen Mädchen besonders hingezogen. Und er stand dann immer oben am. He felt particularly attracted to this young girl. He always stood up in the attic, looking down into the playground, saw Marion playing, and got this funny feeling. I want to have this girl, and I will snatch her up at the next opportunity. And the four-year-old girl did then come into his flat with him, and then he strangled her, and after that did all these awful things that one can scarcely bear to talk about. Schlimme Dinge gemacht, über die man kaum sprechen mag. Well, I was shocked, because I had a son who was not that much older. I had not been in the homicide division long, only for two years. That was something where you had to more than just swallow. I have seen many things, but this was something completely new to me, that a human being was able to do such a thing. Kroll had evaded detection for so long and had no remorse whatsoever for the suffering he'd caused. He was not capable of feeling any sort of empathy towards anybody, especially his victims. They were simply objects to him that he wanted to manipulate and kill. And then he was content. Achim Kroll never cared about what he did. He did not even ask what her name was. He did not care. His tingling feeling was gone. The body remained there. He got up, possibly cleaned himself up. And then the matter was done for him. There was not even a reaction like, when I count them up, you've been able to prove so many, that is so bad. Such things we did not hear from him. In that regard, he was totally emotionless. Although he had confessed to killing at least 14 people, the police officially charged Joachim Kroll with eight murders. On the 4th of October 1979, Kroll's hearing began in Duisburg. As the details of Kroll's gruesome sexual deviance were revealed, the case caught the public's imagination in a way few others have. As a D the, in some cases, excessive media coverage obviously contributed to Kroll becoming a case of the century. But on the other hand, from a criminologist's perspective, one has to say that there hasn't been a comparable case in Germany, at least since the Second World War, where so many people have been killed over such a long period. Over the next two and a half years, the court was only in session 151 times. But in April 1982, Kroll was convicted of all eight murder charges against him. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. The 49-year-old was immediately sent to Rheinbach prison. Also Kroll is for me neither verrückt nor böse, um, but in my view, Kroll wasn't mad or bad, but was a human being who had failed in social terms sexually and in his work life, and who on this basis committed the most terrible crimes. In my opinion, Joachim Kroll would not have become a serial killer if he had been valued as a human being. Whilst most of his victims were, were young, that there was somebody who was in their 60s. So there was a, a, an array of victims. There wasn't a, a particular type. And the fact that he got away with this for so long, I think we should really ask ourselves a lot of questions, you know, as a society. How does somebody like this go under the radar for that long? On July the 1st, 1991, nine years after being convicted, Joachim Kroll died of a heart attack in Rheinbach prison. He was 58 years old. I think Kroll did some incredibly evil things, um, which really do kind of breach not just legal codes, but, but social and moral ones as well. And what's interesting for me is well, what made him into this person that, that did these, these evil things. He didn't really have very much in the way of monitoring of his behavior or any breaks on his behavior. So I think when you have a situation like that, you can have somebody who, who turns into someone capable of, of real evil. The news of Kroll's demise was of scant consolation to Marlies Voivod. Ich habe, nachdem ich das erfahren habe, in mir persönlich Hass gefühlt auf Joachim Kroll. Und After I heard about it, I felt hatred for Kroll and would have liked to wish on him that everything he did to the children and to the adults would be done to him. 
And I'm sorry that he died so early. And, and this anger I have will probably never go away. And this wood will wohl auch immer in mir bleiben. Had he not kidnapped Marion Ketter close to home, in one of his very few mistakes in this killing spree of 20 years or more, then I'm absolutely sure he would continue to kill. If there is ever anyone who could be said to epitomize what the word evil means, I would say it was Joachim Kroll, a genuinely evil man who defiled the world he inhabited. For 21 years, West Germany was haunted by an almost invisible killer. Joachim Kroll was so ordinary that he blended into the background. While other men were accused of his most vile crimes, he continued to murder for his own gratification, regardless of the consequences. His capture came as a shock to the whole country, who will remember Kroll as one of the world's most evil killers. In 2002, in Bournemouth, on the south coast of England, police were called to the scene of a disturbance in a residential street. Two young children were distraught and being comforted by a neighbour. When the police entered the house, they found the mother horrifically murdered. Her body has been mutilated, but bizarrely, in her hands, are cut head hair. It's cut head hair, but it's not her hair. It's hair which is alien from that scene. The murderer had conned his way into his victim's house, attacked and killed the woman, then mutilated her body. His name was Danilo Restivo. Most people, when they've committed a murder, they want to get as far away from that body as possible, as quickly as possible. But this is somebody who enjoys spending time with the body and, and mutilating it. This has a fetishistic, uh, an almost sadistic element above and beyond the usual simple motives for homicide. But police discovered that this was not the first time he had killed. Their investigation revealed Danilo Restivo to be one of the world's most evil killers. On the 12th of November 2002, Bournemouth police had received a 999 call from a terrified 14-year-old and his 11-year-old sister. They had returned home from school to find their mother's body mutilated in the bathroom. The investigating officer was Phil James. The police were called at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The uh, initial response would be made by uniformed police officers as soon as they realised it was a murder. I received a call and I drove to Bournemouth and I took command of that murder investigation. The woman was a local seamstress, 48-year-old Heather Barnett. Her children had returned home from school and expected to find her. When they received no response to their arrival, the children searched the house and found their mother's mutilated body. When we look at the, the mutilation of Heather's body, both of her breasts have been cut off. She's got some hair in her hand. The, there's a glove um, down by her underwear. Um, so what's happened here is that this offender has completely humiliated his victim. He's taken the, the very kind of symbols of her femininity, her, her breasts, and taken that away. So this is, this is a very distinct signature. It's an incredibly unique thing. The killer was Heather's neighbor, 30-year-old Danilo Restivo. When police arrived at the scene, they found Restivo and his girlfriend comforting his victim's children. They'd been uh, uh, befriended by the two uh, Italians from across the road who ended up becoming ex extremely significant to the inquiry. Although he would soon become their prime suspect in this seemingly random killing, police were unable to prove Restivo was responsible. It would take another eight years till Restivo could finally be charged with Heather's murder. Due to the extreme nature of the killing, police were determined never to let him out of their sight.
we never left that case. Even as the years progressed, you worked long, hard days and you were always thinking about that case, you know, about the children, about the horrific scene and about that always the ongoing risk that this man who was walking about, driving about Bournemouth, presented to the public. By the time Restivo was finally caught and faced trial for the murder of Heather Barnett, the police had already uncovered connections to another murder in Italy. The sensational case made headlines across the globe. This was truly an horrendous and distressing murder that took away a person that was very special to many, many people. He was sentenced to a minimum of 40 years in prison. I can remember after that, after he was found guilty later that day, there wasn't massive celebrations. It was just, at last, you know, we've done it for the family. Restivo may have finally faced judge and jury in the UK, but this killer's story begins in Italy in 1972. He was born in Sicily, and his family later moved to Potenza in southern Italy. Potenza is a small Italian city, um, which is, is quite a way away from all the other cities, not just geographically, but, but also culturally. This is a city where the church is very influential. His, his family were amongst the great and good of Potenza, so he grew up in, in quite a privileged position. His family were quite powerful. His father was the, the director of the, the local branch of the, the National Library. Um, he was, was quite an influential figure within the local community. If you would say his father's name, everybody would know who that was. It was clear from a very young age that Restivo was different from other children in Potenza. Well, Restivo, as a child, um, he had glasses, he was quite podgy. He's the, the kind of boy who would have been the target for, for bullies at school. He was the kind of boy who would never really fit in with his peers. But, but I think in those, those early days, he got a sense that I'm an outsider, I'm not one of this group, so I'm going to make up my own rules. He was awkward as well in the way he talked to women, um, which is, it, it's, it's hard for you to try, try to talk to somebody when you, you look awkward and you act awkward. Age 21, Restivo became obsessed with a young girl. In 1993, he was a young guy and it was clear he had an infatuation for a girl called Elisa Claps. Elisa Claps was 16 and she had said to friends, that Restivo was becoming a bit of a problem, that he was chasing after her. Elisa may have been irritated by Restivo's attention, but one Sunday she was willing to meet him at the local church. She's a good, kind person. Um, there are many stories of her going out of her way to, to help other people in, in the community. And I think she's somebody who feels quite sympathetic towards Restivo. She sees this lad who is an outcast, who's sort of picked on and bullied by the people. And I think she, she feels a, a sense of kind of care towards him. So when he asks whether she would come and meet him, she goes along with it because she doesn't for a million years think that, that his intentions are bad. On a particular Sunday, she had arranged to meet up with him outside of the church in Potenza in order that she could say to him, look, I don't want a relationship with you. I don't want to go out with you, and can you leave me alone? Elisa was seen going to meet Restivo in the church, but that was the last time she was ever seen alive. Both Elisa and uh, Restivo went to that church. Restivo left and returned home, and Elisa was never seen again. Concerned for Elisa's safety, her family reported her missing to the police. There were quite a lot of conspiracy theories that developed around her disappearance, and one of them related to a page in her diary um, which was missing, and, and it was thought that the words that were on that page were in Albanian. So there was this idea that she'd been kidnapped by this Albanian criminal gang. An innocent girl just completely vanishes off the face of the earth. It, it's rife for speculation. The local police were called by the family to investigate her disappearance. A number of inquiries were made to find her. 
she was never found and she was considered a missing person. However, there were a number of complications or issues which the Italian police were not overly concerned about following up. We know, for example, that sometime after Lisa went missing, she supposedly sent an email to her family saying, hi, I've left the country, I'm not here any longer, don't worry about me, I'm having a new life, everything's wonderful, uh, and just forget about me. A number of inquiries were made in relation to that, and that email wasn't sent from abroad, it was sent from an internet cafe in Potenza, and it was sent at a time when Restivo was in that internet cafe. During the investigation, the local police missed some vital clues that could have quickly led them to Restivo. He had a, a history of, of taking young girls behind a, a curtain and up to the first floor in the church. There was an injury on his hand um, around about the time of her disappearance. And none of this was really scrutinised. None of it was really looked into by the police. The family did not know it yet, but 21-year-old Restivo had in fact killed Elisa and hidden her in the attic of the church. Danilo Restivo would eventually be convicted of the murder of 16-year-old Elisa Claps in Italy in 1993. But it would take nearly 18 years to bring him to justice. What was known by the people in the small town of Potenza where he grew up was that as a young man, Restivo would chase after young girls in unusual ways. He approaches them and when they reject him, he turns on them essentially and he calls them and he plays the theme tune of his favourite film, Profondo Rosso, which is quite scary, quite intimidating music. And this is, this is a really odd thing to be doing, but what he's trying to do is trying to instill fear in these girls. He's trying to say, oh, well, you've rejected me, so I'm now going to play a bit of a game with you. And I think that really does just tell us about his underlying psychopathy. He's somebody who likes playing with people. Restivo became obsessed with one girl in particular, Elisa Claps. But when she rejected Restivo's romantic approaches, he reacted in the most extreme way. Unbeknownst to her family and the police, Restivo had in fact killed her and hidden her body in 1993. At the time, the police considered Elisa a missing person as her body was not found. That, along with some legal obstacles, meant the investigation in Italy was halted. Rumours were rife that this was because of Restivo's family and their connections with the police and the authorities. In Italy, certain positions within a town are considered uh, high-powered and influential, and Restivo's father was the chief librarian. And in Italy, the chief librarian is a significant and powerful individual. To Danilo Restivo, it seemed like he'd got away with murder, but Elisa's family never gave up. Since Restivo was the last person to have seen her alive, he was suspected by much of the town as having something to do with her disappearance. Being under observation, Restivo was unable to chase women to fulfill his unusual passions. In 2002, he turned 30 and decided to begin a new chapter of his life in Bournemouth in the south of England. I think when Restivo arrives in the UK, he is a very dangerous individual because he's never faced any consequences for his actions. He's in a country where nobody knows his history, nobody can join the dots together. So he really is like a, a kid in a sweet shop. He's got every opportunity to continue offending and nobody really knows his background. Restivo met an Italian woman on the internet and he quickly moved in with her. They lived on a suburban street in Bournemouth. She's an, an older woman, she has a, a disability. She's more of a mother figure to him and she treats him as if he's a son. She looks after him, she cooks his meals. So he's, he's stepping into his well-established role as this child in a different location. Restivo's new home was opposite that of 48-year-old seamstress Heather Barnett. Just six months after moving in on the 6th of November 2002, he went to visit Heather. He claimed he wanted her to do some work for him. And Mr. Restivo had been over and asked if she would make a set of curtains for him as a Christmas present for his then 
partner. And you think, well, that's a pretty strange Christmas present for a man to give a woman. Restivo had been discussing the work with Heather. However, Restivo wasn't interested in curtains. Instead, he identified Heather as his next victim. On the 12th of November 2002, he paid his neighbour another visit. They'd gone through to uh, the back of the property, which was her room for doing her sewing and seamstress type work. And from there, it appears that she tried to make an escape from the individual. Things were knocked over. She'd moved through into the lounge where he'd obviously caught hold of her and he'd hit her several times with a hammer. Uh, her skull was fractured and she would have been dead in the lounge very shortly afterwards. Uh, from that point, she was dragged through the lounge, through the hallway and into a bathroom. Restivo had brutally murdered Heather in her own home. He then placed a lock of hair in her hand. Curiously, it was not Heather's hair. Restivo's callousness did not end there. He then mutilated Heather's body. He cut the breasts off and placed them behind Heather's head. He also mutilated the rest of the body quite badly. This maybe would show that his obsession was not simply the hair, but possibly the cutting of hair and cutting itself. To cut someone's skin would possibly have also excited him. A few hours later, police arrived at the scene. They were greeted by Restivo and his partner, who were looking after Heather's two young children. Well, the children discovered their mother's body, and, and not only that, but Restivo was one of the, the first people on the scene and, and appeared to be comforting them. But this isn't particularly surprising to me. When you have an offender like Restivo, he's quite proud of what, what he's done. So it's, it's not enough for him to mutilate his victim's body. He wants to see the impact of his actions on the people around the victim. Uh, and that is enhancing his enjoyment and enhancing his, his sense of, of power over these people. Other than Heather's son and daughter, Restivo and his partner were the only people present at the scene. Restivo was very keen to point out to the police that he'd been out all that day before discovering the distraught children in the street. We started to look at Mr Restivo, but from the very beginning, we were being told he had a strong alibi that explained where he was all day. So. Uh, immediately you think well it can't be him so you start to look at other areas and it wasn't until other issues started to develop with Mr Restivo that it was necessary to go back and look at his alibi and say how strong is this alibi regardless of this the police made Restivo the center of their investigation because he'd been at the scene, in any case, we were interested, we wanted his DNA so that we could either implicate or eliminate him from those inquiries. We started to ask questions about his relationship, if he, if he knew Heather, what involvement he had with Heather. It became clear that Restivo had previously met Heather to discuss making some curtains. So when he arrived on the doorstep to kill her, he was welcomed into the house. Mr Restivo, had spent a great deal of time um, considering what he was going to do. He must have planned that murder in great detail. It was Restivo's meticulous attention to detail that police hoped to take advantage of and use it to connect him to the murder. Her body has been mutilated, but bizarrely in her hands are cut head hair. It's cut head hair, but it's not her hair. It's hair which is alien from that scene. So you're trying to understand why somebody who's going to murder somebody has brought with them hair to a murder scene. In Heather's left hand was a lock of her own hair. In the right, a lock of someone unknown's hair. This strange obsession with hair would eventually lead to Restivo's downfall. 
Well, many people would describe Restivo as a trichophile. He's got an obsession with hair. Paraphilia is a, a sexual attraction towards an inanimate object or a non-consenting party. Because when you cut somebody's hair and you, you take a piece of that hair, you're taking part of them and it's making you feel quite powerful. But this is really odd behavior. It's incredibly abnormal behavior. When police searched Heather's house, they found plenty of evidence. There was a lot of blood about, and the training shoes worn by the killer left trails of uh, blood-splattered footprints around the house. But bizarrely, although they moved around the house, they, they never left and went to the, to the front door of the property. By carrying out forensic tests, could work out that the killer had moved around the house to a point in the lounge where there was a chair, and in our opinion, he had then changed his clothing. Police, however, were unable to connect Restivo to the killing. Restivo would be what we describe as forensically aware. That means they know what sort of evidence they may be leaving. So he had the foresight to change his clothes. He had the foresight to change gloves. He had the foresight to try and get rid of bloodstains using bleach. He was aware of the sort of things that could be found that could link him to a crime, and he was doing what he could to prevent that happening. He comes extremely well prepared. He has a plan, he executes that plan, and then he leaves the house in fresh clothes that aren't going to cause concern to any passers-by. The only thing out of place at the crime scene was a green towel found near the front door of Heather Barnett's house. We considered that the murderer had stopped, taken off his training shoes. Bizarrely, there was a chair and there was a green towel on it. That green towel had uh, blood on it, but we always believed that that green towel was alien to that house. Our belief was that that wasn't their towel and that it had been brought there by the killer. That towel was a constant main line of inquiry in order to try and identify the killer by his DNA. We knew that Heather's blood was on that towel, but there was a mixed profile in that blood, so it meant to say there was the profile of, of at least two individuals. Despite their suspicions, police were not able to extract a DNA connection to Restivo, and they were unable to bring any charges against him at this time. Restivo felt he'd got away with murder again. Restivo is somebody who's used to, to getting away with his crimes. This has been something that he's been doing for a very long time, both in his native Italy and in the UK as well. So this is somebody who feels untouchable. He's never had to face any consequences for his actions. So he's got no reason to believe that things are going to change. So he's just going to carry on regardless. By the end of 2002, police had identified Danilo Restivo as the prime suspect. They knew they were dealing with a dangerous man and were doing all they could to gather enough evidence to arrest him. We shortly came to the conclusion that Daniela Restivo was the person that had killed Heather Barnett. He went over there during that morning and killed Heather Barnett, and then he knew that the persons that would find Heather are her two children, a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old, and that they would come back and find that scene. You know, that's, that's beyond anybody's imagination and cruelty to do that. On arrival at the scene of the crime, one of the first things Restivo had done was to supply police with an alibi for the day. But on closer examination, what Restivo told them did not add up. He had gone to a place for unemployed people to learn computer skills, uh, and the signing in register showed that he'd signed in at a specific time. But when we looked at it again, the entry had been altered. It had been written over, so it said one time, and it also said another time. So it then indicated that perhaps that alibi wasn't as good as first thought. Restivo was their only suspect. When detectives began to uncover his past in Italy, their suspicions only grew stronger. It was about six months into that inquiry when uh, 
one of the detectives working on the case came into my office and said, boss, I need to speak to you. I've done a lot of research on the internet and we've managed to find details of a girl who went missing in Potenza in 1993 and there is a link to Daniello Restivo. Uh, soon after we started making inquiries about Elisa's death. But at this point, Elisa was still considered just a missing person by Italian police. It had not reached the stage of a murder inquiry. In the case of Eliza Claps, to start with, there wasn't even a body. Running a murder investigation, if you can't even prove somebody's dead, let alone how they died, is clearly far more difficult. There have been successful prosecutions with no body, but they're much rarer. And in the UK, although there was a body, there was not enough evidence to arrest Restivo for murder, so he was allowed to carry on his daily life. By March 2004, 16 months after the murder, police were convinced Restivo was a danger to the community, so they put him under surveillance. Then, in May that same year, investigators made a break in the case. We followed uh, Restivo for quite a while, and there was one specific incident that it still now chills me to think about it. He went down to an area called Throop, the edge of Bournemouth on the countryside, and on the morning in question, Restivo went down there. There were about half a dozen ladies on their own walking their dogs in this isolated area, and Restivo buried himself in a bush and was clearly watching these individuals. Everywhere he went and the risk that he presented, we're always concerned, is today a day where he's going to kill another Heather Barnett. Is he walking around with a knife in his bag today? Well, when we look at Restivo's behaviour when he's under surveillance, this is the height of summer. Um, he's walking around with gloves on, he's got his hood up, um, he, he's got waterproof trousers on, he's filmed changing his clothes, and the police see that he's observing women from a distance as well. He's very clearly out hunting for women. Afraid that he was getting ready to kill again, the police moved in. I arranged for two uniform officers to go down, check him out. Mr Restivo was wearing two sets of clothing. He had one set of clothing and then he had another set on top and a nylon a waterproof jacket. So very similar to Heather's murder where he's got, he's took two sets of clothing with him and changed into one. He's down there in the same. The police stopped Restivo and searched his bag. In his rucksack, he had gloves, he had a filleting knife, he had other material in there, and it was just horrific. And so he was, he was brought in, he was arrested, but he explained everything, it's perfectly easy. You know, I was, well, I'm wearing two sets of clothing because I was exercising and I want to lose some weight and it helps me perspire. Uh, and I, I can't remember the explanation for the knife, but it was, oh, I've been somewhere and I just happened to still have it in my bag. I've just bought it or something. And again, extremely concerning, but as far as the Crown Prosecution Service were concerned, it wasn't that final piece of the jigsaw and it didn't prove Restivo had killed Heather Barnett. Again, Restivo could not be charged with murder police needed more evidence to pin him to the killing of Heather Barnett. I think Restivo became aware of the idea that the police were interested in him and that he could have been connected to the murder, but he had an explanation for every part of his bizarre behaviour. He felt that he was in control of that information and he actually did envision himself carrying on and committing further crimes. The police changed tack. They appealed to the public for more information. This time they focused on the hair belonging to an unknown person found in Heather's right hand. Appeals were broadcast in the UK and in Restivo's hometown of Potenza and across Italy. And then you suddenly get a call and they say, Hi, I'm such and such from Potenza. Daniel Restivo cut my hair once. I was sat in a cinema, and he was sat in the row behind, and he took some of my head hair and cut it and took it away. And somebody else was saying, 
Oh yeah, that happened to me. Daniel Esteva was well known for cutting women's hair. And when we came back and we started to ask the same question, had people in Bournemouth had their hair cut? Women started to come forward to say, yeah, in fact, I was on one of the Bournemouth yellow buses and I had some hair cut and I looked round and there was a guy sat behind me. Or I went to the hairdressers once and she said, you've got a big chunk of hair missing from the back of your hair. When has that happened? Steve actually developed a paraphilia um, for hair. This may have been some originating um, s situation where he felt, you know, sexually excited, etc., over um, contact with hair. His victims had their hair cut, um, often from behind. He, he wasn't in the social world. He was in a very focused, obsessive world. In June 2004, the police questioned Restivo again. This time, they asked him specifically about his hair-cutting activities. The investigators were hoping to connect Restivo to the hair found in Heather's hand at the murder scene two years earlier. We put Daniela Restivo on an identification parade, and in two instances, those women picked Daniela Restivo out as the man who had sat behind them on a local bus, cut their hair, and then got off the bus. So we always knew he had a hair fetish. We knew that he'd brought alien head hair into the murder scene and left it in uh, Heather's hand. Restivo said that, that when he held these women's hair in his hand, he said everything is, is visible and, and that he could see everything. It's making him realise, I can, can take a piece of these women and I can possess them. He's got a real kind of a grandiose sense of himself, a, a real kind of elevated sense of his own power here. But all this evidence was circumstantial and was still not enough to convince the courts that Restivo could be charged with Heather's murder. This, this man is truly evil. He prepared some time in advance to kill this lovely single lady who's bringing up two lovely children. He killed her in the most horrific manner, mutilating her body, and knowing the most evil part of him is he knew that the people that would find their mother mutilated in the worst possible way was her two young children. Are you telling me that somebody who could do that is not evil? Restivo was released yet again without charge. To prove him guilty, the police needed to connect Restivo to the crime scene. Their hopes rested on the green towel with blood splatters that was found in Heather's hallway the day she was murdered. But to make the case against Restivo, they had a major hurdle to overcome. The forensic technology and the forensic advances weren't there. But we kept going back to that green towel and saying, how can we develop or, or separate out that mixed profile? And it did take a number of years before forensic science advanced, and we were able to do that. Police would finally connect Restivo directly to Heather's murder. But it would take the discovery of a body in Italy to bring this murderer to justice. What lies behind Restivo's motivation to kill and, and mutilate women is a, a sense of power. So he does so in the, the most extreme way, in, in killing them and mutilating them and, and using their hair as, as something that he has that's part of them. Police in Dorset had already found a connection between Restivo and several cases of women having had their hair cut off by a stranger in public. But it was a murder in Bournemouth in November of 2002 that was their primary focus. In 2008, police re-examined a blood-stained green towel that they had found in the house of murder victim, seamstress Heather Barnett. Critically, the towel had two different types of DNA on it. It took some years for DNA analysis to progress to the stage where the material on the green towel, which we said Restivo had left at Heather Barnett's address, could be analysed and produce a profile which could be put forward as evidence. 
But then in 2008, we find that magic solution and it's that final bit of that jigsaw where the scientists say, look, we can now separate out those two bits of DNA. We can now separate Heather's out and we can identify whose DNA that is. And that DNA that separated out from that towel belongs to Daniello Restivo. Finally, the investigators felt they had enough evidence to charge Restivo with the murder of Heather Barnett. To make certain, they also needed to tie Restivo to the murder of 16-year-old Elisa Claps back in Italy in 1993. But with no body found, all they had were their suspicions. Elisa was still classed as a missing person. Then, in March of 2010, a remarkable discovery was made that would seal the case and Restivo's fate. At the stage when Restivo was first charged, Elisa Clapp's body had not in fact been found, and so we proceeded purely on the UK evidence. However, on the 17th of March 2010, Elisa's body was discovered in the loft in the church in Potenza, where it in fact it had been since she disappeared on the 12th of September 1993. When Elisa's body was found in the church that Daniello and Elisa had met outside of and had been in it was decided that myself and another officer would immediately fly over to Italy to try and work with the Italian police because we wanted to look at the similarities between the murder scene of Elisa and our murder scene because as far as we were concerned, Daniela Restivo had murdered both individuals. We were allowed to go down to Salerno, which is the main city near Potenza, we were allowed to see the videos and we were allowed to speak to some of the scientists. And lo and behold, there were things like hair in Elisa's hand, the same as there were in, in, in Heather's case. And it started to make a bit more sense. So Restivo's signature is quite evident in both cases. So both of the women have hair in their hands. Both of them have their trousers pulled down. So this is quite a distinct thing in itself. Here is a case where the offender has spent time with both of these victims. But the crucial difference for me is that whilst Eliza's body was hidden, Heather's body was displayed. He got to the point in his offending here where he's saying, hey, look at me. So this is somebody who's evolved over time and, and it's really, really concerning. This is somebody who's not going to stop unless they're caught. The UK police could not charge Restivo in relation to the murder of Elisa Claps as the crime was committed in Italy and so out of their territory. But connecting Restivo to the murder of Elisa solidified their case in regard to the murder of Heather Barnett. Even though he'd never been tried in Italy for that crime, we adduced all the evidence in relation to Elisa Claps' murder in order to prove him guilty of Heather Barnett's murder. Finally, in May 2011, Danilo Restivo went to court, charged with the murder of Heather Barnett. We've arrested Daniello Restivo on a number of occasions, and we've always also lived with the concern that he's also so dangerous, he's likely to kill again. And eventually, the case is solved, and we've got that magic solution, and we've got that final piece of the jigsaw. It had been a long battle, but in the end, the murder Restivo had committed in 1993 and thought he had got away with was to be the deciding factor when he faced judge and jury. The police were having quite a hard time of it, getting enough evidence together to be able to, to meet that, that threshold, to be able to secure a, a conviction. But then when Eliza's body was discovered, you've got these two women thousands of miles and 17 years apart, but they're connected by one thing, and that's Restivo. He had always thought he was cleverer than everybody else, but now that didn't matter. He wasn't cleverer than everybody else. He wasn't cleverer than us. We had beaten him and we'd solved the case. And because the evidence was so powerful and overwhelming, it did make him look like an idiot in terms of some of his responses. Whereas before, he could show that bluster and he could say, it's not me. Well, when he said that now, it was meaningless because the evidence was overwhelming and it did prove it was him. 
The jury unanimously found Restivo guilty of Heather Barnett's murder. Of course, they could not return a verdict in relation to Elisa Claps because Restivo is an Italian subject and therefore could not be charged with her murder. The jury retired and returned verdict on the same day and thereafter Restivo was sentenced. There is, of course, satisfaction that justice has been done, but I think really an overwhelming feeling of sadness that two people had died wholly unnecessarily to satisfy his, his lust for killing. Heather Barnett was a, a local woman in Bournemouth. She was a, a mother to two children. And, and that's one of the things that I find quite annoying about cases like Restivo. When you've got such a, a grotesque and such a, a unique murderer, there's a tendency to forget the victims and, and they become known as, as the victims of Restivo. These two women, Elisa and Heather, were individuals in their own right. They, they had lives, they had families, they had futures, and, and that was callously taken away by Restivo. In June 2011, Restivo was given a whole life sentence for the murder of Heather Barnett. He later appealed and was given a life sentence and ordered to serve a minimum of 40 years. Meanwhile, in Italy in November 2011, a court in Salerno found Danilo Restivo, in his absence, guilty of the murder of 16-year-old Elisa Claps in 1993. With someone like Restivo, with that very specific MO, with two cases so far apart and so similar, there has to be more. We need to look very carefully into the past of Danilo Restivo because he must have struck elsewhere. Since his imprisonment, Restivo's name has been linked with other murders, but no charges have been brought. However, the horrific murders of both Elisa Claps and Heather Barnett have shown that Danilo Restivo is one of the world's most evil killers.